Okay. Uh, good morning and welcome to the 34th meeting of the committee in 2014. Uh, everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones and other electronic equipment as they affect the broadcasting system. Some committee members uh, may refer to uh, tablets during the meeting. This is because we provide meeting papers in a digital format. Uh, the first item of business today is our fourth oral evidence session on the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill. We have two panels of witnesses this morning discussing the alcohol licensing and scrap metal dealership provisions in the Bill. Uh, I'd like to welcome the first panel this morning, uh, Dr Deborah Shipton, Programme Lead, Alcohol Focus Scotland, Dr Sonia Scott, Consultant in Public Health Medicine, NHS Ayrshire and Arran, Janice Thompson, Alcohol and Drug Partnership Coordinator, East Renfrewshire Drug and Alcohol Partnership, and Audrey Watson, Managing Solicitor of the West Lothian uh, Licensing Board. Good morning to you all. Uh, would you like to make any opening statements at all? Dr Shipton? Do you want to go ahead? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to give evidence. AFS is a national charity uh, working to reduce harm experienced by individuals, families and communities. We know the significant harm in uh, Scotland to those to, who uh, consume it and also to those around them. One in two people each year are affected by alcohol in Scotland in terms of family, friends, co-workers, etc. And one in three have a drinker in their lives. In total, uh, alcohol harm costs Scotland £3.6 billion per year in terms of health, criminal justice, etc. The evidence across the world uh, suggests that tackling availability is... Um, uh, of alcohol is the most effective means of addressing alcohol harm and licensing is one of the key levers that we have to do that at the local level. This bill strengthens uh, uh, previous legislation um, and is a potential to create a very robust licensing system for Scotland. There are some issues in how this is translated into practice and this has been identified in the evaluation of the 2005 Act. Uh, but there still remains an issue in terms of the accountability and the transparency of the current licensing regime, which limits how the system can function in practice. And I hope I might be able to have the opportunity to discuss that this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms Thompson, I think you indicated. Yes, thank you. Um, alcohol and drug partnerships are responsible for planning and delivering effective local strategies to prevent and reduce harm from drugs and alcohol on the basis of both evidence and need. The alcohol licensing system is an important means through which the Scottish Government priorities set out in changing Scotland's relationship with alcohol, a framework for action, can be achieved. Furthermore, the licensing system has a, plays a key contribution to make through the implementation of the licensing policy statement and the over-provision assessment to support the achievement of community planning and alcohol and drug partnership priorities to prevent and reduce harm. The ADP welcomes provisions within the Act to include criminalising the supply of alcohol to children and young people, introducing a fit and proper test for applicants and redefining over-provision. We raised some issues within our submission regarding the accountability and transparency of boards and how they exercise their function with regard to the licensing policy statement. We made recommendations in relation to the guidance should be reviewed and amended to assist the proper interpretation of the use of the evidence to support effective licensing practice, and boards should provide a summary of how they achieved their decision on over-provision. Finally, we recommended that boards should provide an annual report on how they discharged their duties with regard to licensing policy statement and five licensing objectives. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Dr Scott or Ms Watson, do you want to add anything? Dr Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, like my colleagues, I would like to emphasise that there's good evidence um, showing an association between availability and harm. And I'm here particularly to advocate for the retention of the requirement that boards consider capacity and number of outlets when thinking about their over-provision um, assessments. OK, thank you very much. And uh, let's look at over-provision first. Um, can I ask you uh, what your current experience is of how licensing authorities deal with their duty to assess over provision. Dr Shipton, would you like to go first, please? Uh, yes, from the uh, uh, information that we have, there was a, a AFS conducted a review of um, policy statements, and in that, um, there was uh, 
tended to be a lack of evidence for how the overprovision assessment was um, the the, decision, the um, outcome was uh, derived. Um, so we would feel that there's a uh, greater need for evidence um, to back up the decisions that licensing boards make uh, around this. And I think my other colleagues will probably talk to uh, the difficulties that licensing boards have in uh, trying to um, take the evidence to make that decision. Thank you. Dr Scott, please. I think that licensing boards have difficulty understanding the concept of overprovision and what it actually means. Um, initially, there was lots of evidence given by our board around levels of harm at mainly um, local authority level. There's issues about data in terms of harm and the appropriate geographical level where, at which we're able to provide it, and it's most robust for us at higher geographical levels. I think there's also a difficulty in terms of transferring from an individual perspective to a population perspective. And as a public health doctor, I'm interested in that population perspective. So it's about aggregate levels of data. On one level, given that we have alcohol-related harm and it's entirely avoidable, you could say that any harm <laughs> equals over-provision. It could also be considered in terms of outlet density, weighted for capacity, and I think that would be a good, a reasonable measure of um, availability. But I think, as I say, that boards do struggle with that, and there isn't any guidance or criteria for, uh, for them around that. So we know that many boards have um, stated in their policy statements that they're not overprovided for, but there's no um, justification for why they've reached that decision or their process in reaching it. Ms Thompson? Yeah, I think I would like to agree with my colleagues here in terms of boards do struggle in terms of over-provision. There should be clear guidance on how that's interpreted. We have, at a local level, um, discussed with the board in terms of the, the data that would be required and have provided very comprehensive and robust information. Again, we've looked at this from a, an intermediate data zone level, but also have made clear recommendations that are currently with the board. But Having looked at the EFS report, it, there is um, not clarity about how some boards have made their decisions, about the evidence that's been used to underpin the five licensing objectives in the policy statement, and also how licensing boards actually come to the decision on, on over-provision. I, I think they do struggle, and it's our role to support that, but also to be much clearer in the guidance about what should be contained within that. Ms Watson? Yes, certainly. Um, Last year, when, when our board looked at over-provision, we, were, we were, had some difficulty in getting any evidence from the people that we contacted. We sent out information to all the parties laid out in the Section 142 guidance, and we got very little back, apart from Police Scotland, who identified some hotspot areas, which allowed us to identify the localities. But beyond that, we got no response at all from, from NHS Lothian and very little response that was up to date from any of the other parties. Um, I think in your submission to the committee, Ms Watson from West Lothian, um, it said something along the lines, and I paraphrase, that um, health issues were not taken into account. Would that be correct? Well, we had no evidence, and the, the guidance makes it very clear that boards must make decisions on evidence. So in, in your area, the NHS Lothian have, have never... Um, given ev any evidence at all to they've the never, West Lothian board? They've never given any evidence, nor do they respond to any applications sent to them. There's never been a presence at the board. Um, in terms of, of uh, the rest of, of Lothian, are you aware of any other licensing boards where NHS Lothian... I'm not, and I can really only speak for the last couple of years. Okay. It may have been in, at the beginning of 2009 they were... There was a presence, but certainly in the last two years since I've been managing the team, there's been no, um, there's been no, no one from NHS Lothian either writing to us or engaging with us in any way. In terms of the other witnesses, are you aware of any health authorities contacting boards about over-provision? Dr Shipton, please. I think that we have 40 licensing boards, and I think it's a good opportunity to identify best practice. So, so there are some licensing boards who have worked very closely with their ADPs and their um, health board areas to develop the evidence um, for that. So I think it's worth learning from that. Some uh, health board or some licensing board areas have developed quite nuanced um, over-provision statements. Uh, for example, just as um, Western Isles have uh, vertical drink drinking establishments and off-sales only establishments in a particular area. So they're really responding 
to the needs in that area. And I understand there's variation across the country in terms of engaging with the partners, but I think it's probably worth identifying there has been progress in this. The over-provision statement is, uh, is fairly new, sort of under five years in terms of, or more than that actually, um, fairly, fairly new in terms of um, uh, this type of policy development. So I think it's worth understanding that there is a lot to be learnt from this, but un there is good practice that's happening across Scotland. Dr Scott? Certainly our board has provided significant evidence to the three local authorities which um, are our partner local authorities, the three um, licensing, alcohol licensing boards. Um, what I would say is that we do rely on alcohol and drug ring fenced monies like other areas of the NHS provide a service around alcohol and drugs and obviously that can be an issue as um, budgets become tighter. Um, I think, as um, Dr Shipton has already indicated, it does rely on really strong relationships, particularly with ADPs, and we would see our work around alcohol and drugs from a public health perspective being very much through our alcohol and drug partners, um, and I'm sure um, Ms Thompson can speak about her experience of um, ADP evidence in East Renfrewshire. Um, before I take Ms Thompson in, um, you mentioned local authorities there. And I think we all make the mistake uh, when we're talking about licensing boards about talking about local authorities. Uh, and I think we've got to remember that licensing boards are quasi-judicial bodies. And it may well be that a local authority has a single outcome agreement, various things round about alcohol, um, uh, but the licensing board is somewhat different. Yes, Do you want absolutely. to expand on that a little bit and tell us how you, how you deal with boards rather than authorities. No, absolutely, that was my error and I accept that correction. Just in our area they're coterminous with our local authorities rather than any uh, local authorities being subdivided so I think of them in terms of North, South and East Ayrshire. Apologies. Okay, thank you. Cameron Buchanan, please. Do you think the reason you didn't get any response was because they were reluctant to commit themselves, that you got no responses to this inquiry? Was it, do you think, what was the reason you think that nobody replied? of understanding as to what was required. I think the guidance should be updated and should be clearer. Right. It wasn't it's also, because... It's it also that, the, that I think in West Lothian we're, we're kind of alone in that we've got an increasing population. So I think there's an assumption that there is over-provision everywhere, mm. but I don't know that that's, that that's correct. Certainly our board are very concerned with over-consumption rather than over-provision, and it's that that I think that the committee should be looking at how that can be addressed. And do you think the two of them go together? Not necessarily, because no. you can have an area where there, there you know, a, a new Armadale, for example, in West Lothian, there's a new Asda supermarket there. That was necessary for the number of new houses that have been built in that area. And I don't think they would have come had they not got an alcohol licence. However, there is over-consumption, over and boards are seeing that all the time when Police Scotland are doing review applications, but the reality is it's become socially acceptable that people fall about drunk every weekend. We see it on CCTV evidence, and yet no one's ever prosecuted for it. So in terms of that overconsumption uh, versus over-provision scenario, um, and going back to the submission that you made where, you know, um, health is not being taken into account, um, how do we deal with that? You know, because you're saying there is a problem, there's a problem of overconsumption, but your board is, is not looking at the health aspects according um, to, to what you've said. Well, I think we were, as I said, we were unable to look at the health aspects because we simply had no evidence of them. It's not to say that we wouldn't look at them if that evidence was available. And we're actually just out to consultation again with our key stakeholders in relation to um, whether we should be looking at overprovision and whether there actually is evidence. And uh, that door was meant to have closed, but we were asked to keep it open until the end of this year, this calendar year. So we certainly will be looking at the issue of provision in West Lothian again, subject to any evidence coming forward. If that evidence comes forward, we will have a full consultation exercise with all stakeholders. How proactive are you in seeking that evidence? Because obviously you said that you've talked to stakeholders. But, you know, if I was in the position of being on a board, and I have to say that although I was a local authority councillor, I never was on a licensing board, I would be doing everything possible to try and gather up that evidence and being proactive uh, with the local uh, alcohol and drugs partnership and the uh, NHS board, etc., to try and get that evidence. What efforts have been made in that regard? 
Well, we've certainly um, written to all of these stakeholders. We've attended a number of licensing forum meetings where these stakeholders have been asked to attend as well to discuss the over-provision issue. We followed that up by more correspondence and we had a number of online surveys. Okay. I, I've got a number of members here. Cameron, you go first, please. I think we heard from the Scottish Retail Consortium that supermarkets and places would not open a supermarket unless they could get an alcohol licence, because that's where they made the biggest profit. Could you comment on that? I think it was the Scottish Retail Consortium that said I that. I think I'm unable to comment on that from a commercial or legal right. perspective, but it would appear to me that they wouldn't come unless they got an alcohol licence. Okay. Thank okay. You. John Wilson, please. <coughs> Convener, just to put on record, I did serve on the licensing board, but 32 years ago since I last served on the licensing board. Uh, so my experience is a bit dated. Uh, but the issue in terms of the over-provision, and I note that what we've got before us is a panel uh, with two members from smaller local authorities. And I raised the question last week, is that how do you, does the panel feel we should use the over-provision criteria? Because when you're looking at local authorities such as West Lothian and East Renfrewshire, but then you look at, say, Scottish Borders or Dumfries and Galloway in the Highlands, how do you determine over-provision if some of the outlying villages uh, aren't being served by a off-licence or a licensed premises? How do we deal with that in terms of the, the criteria that we may be setting in terms of over-provision and denying uh, communities the opportunity to actively participate in social drinking. Ms Thompson, do you want to go first, please? Um, yes, just in terms of when you're defining over-provision, you will look at the totality of the area and you'll also break it down into intermediate zones and align that with the licensing board um, region, regional areas. Um, that will look at the number of licensed premises, the capacity of licensed premises, both on and off sales in that area. And the way that we looked at it from an East Remshire perspective, we looked at... Um, included in that the range of health harms and also crime and alcohol related violence and also we did an extensive consultation with both the public and the licensees around um, over provision so you had a triangulation of both quantitative and qualitative evidence there. Now clearly um, it may be that depending on the level of health and alcohol related harm that that boards may decide within their over-provision assessment based on that evidence that the whole area is over-provided. However, that does not preclude um, current premises from trading. It's, it's, the, other, the other factor is it may actually also state within the over-provision assessment that only certain designated areas are over-provided. So I think that doesn't preclude areas and rural areas having access to alcohol and I think you also have to factor in when we when we did um, our assessment we looked at the mobility of people we asked how long it took you to actually access either an on sales or an off sales in your area so, and, and by what means you travel to get there so we found that that by far that all areas in our area were were well served in terms of alcohol but we haven't made recommendation that the whole area is over provided. Ms Watson we certainly had uh, evidence of a number of um, licensed premises surrendering their licenses because it's no longer commercially viable for them. So in, in, that, in that background, it's, it's quite difficult to see where there's over-provision. We also have some areas where they're, they're high in social deprivation and so they perhaps are going to be increasing the NHS um, figures. However, there, there's not a lot of alcohol available in those areas. However, a short taxi ride away, there's one of the biggest asdas in the country. So, so a lot of this uh, surrendering of licences, is that down to the fact that the big chains have moved in? Are these mainly uh, off-sale premises that have surrendered licences rather than on-sales? Both on-sales and off-sales. Okay. Uh, Dr Shipton, please. Um, I, I think I'd, I'd agree with uh, Ms Thompson around uh, needing to respond to the local needs. I think that's the um, advantage of the um, over-provision statement. In the uh, research that uh, you uh, presented with last week um, by Dr Shorts from uh, Edinburgh, 
uh, they've identified the outlet density across the whole of Scotland. And you can see some areas, there are very large areas within a licensing board area that have very light, high levels of provision. And other uh, licensing board areas, it's pockets. So I think that's where the over-provision statements can uh, very much respond to that, as I demonstrated with the, with the Western Isles. And other, other boards have, as I say, uh, responded with very nuanced over-provision statements. So I think they can protect the rural areas and also uh, respond to the higher levels of provision in, say, for example, the urban areas. And Dr Scott, please. Yeah, I would agree with, with what Dr Shipton's just said. Just to answer the question directly, I think um, density is a good way of considering availability. And I would argue that there's strong evidence of an association between availability as it relates to over-provision and consumption, and obviously consumption and then harm. So I think the two are very interrelated, <coughs> the provision in terms of availability and consumption levels. And I think you can consider that comparatively. So um, per capita um, outlet weighted for the capacity of that outlet would be a more robust measure than just the number of outlets. But I think you also need to consider levels of harm. And in Scotland, our levels of harm are twice what they are in England and Wales. About 72% of that is accounted for by off-sales. So there's also issues about types of premises, but in general, I would suggest that we are over-provided for across Scotland. John? Come here. Just to follow up on Ms Watson's response in relation to the surrender of licences, and the, Ms Watson seemed to equate that with the opening of a large supermarket. If we are looking at, and the, Dr Scott just said, that the off-sales, level of off-sales uh, consumption is now greater or potentially greater than it was from on-sales, surely it raises the issue that we should be looking more carefully at the large supermarket uh, selling of alcohol than some of the provision in terms of on-sales and some of the smaller off-sales uh, premises, because if what you've said, Ms Watson, is that licensees are surrendering the licence, and you seem to allude that it was to, down to the opening of a large supermarket that was selling alcohol, uh, surely we should be, uh, or licensing boards should be seriously asking major retailers, uh, such as the major supermarket that you hinted at in terms of, I think it was Bathgate or Livingston, uh, surely we should be looking at those types of off-sales rather than just restricting the on-sales <coughs> I've perhaps confused uh, members. There are two Asda stores within West Lothian. The biggest one is in Livingston it. and there's a smaller one in Armadale, the new development. I, I really struggle with this because there is no six licensing objective that says boards must reduce consumption of alcohol. I think we would all agree that that would be a good thing, but I don't think it's for boards to be able to tackle that problem on their own. I think there has to be a multi-agency um, task force set up. I think if Scotland wants to reduce alcohol consumption, it needs to do something about it in the same way as we've made drink driving socially unacceptable, I think we should make public drunkenness unacceptable because people are learning that from the very time that they're going to their prom to when they're going throughout their whole life that alcohol and being drunk is acceptable. And it certainly wasn't the case when I was growing up. And I don't know how we've got here. On that issue, Ms Watson, are you saying that the current legislation before us doesn't go far enough? As far as I can see, the Act was meant to regulate the sale of alcohol, not restrict the sale of alcohol. And I think some within the uh, alcohol focus type organisations would wish that it wasn't, that it was different. But when cases go before the courts, they're interpreted in relation to what's said in the legislation. And as I said, there's nothing in the legislation that says that boards have to take measures to reduce consumption of alcohol. Dr. Scott. The five licensing objectives are all really about, <clears throat> um, they all have a health and wellbeing component. Obviously there is an explicit protecting and improving public health and from a po population perspective the best way to achieve that objective is um, to reduce availability. Um, so I think there is a wee kind of discrepancy from an individual perspective and that population um, perspective. Dr Shipton. 
I would, I would agree. I think um, that the licensing regime has a public interest purpose, and I think that's where we say um, what is in the public's interest at the moment, the level of harm that we have and the level of consumption that we have in Scotland is uh, uh, very high uh, in terms of within the UK and within Western Europe. So the public interest purpose would be to reduce that. Two of the main levers for that is availability and price. So I think that at this point in time in Scotland, I would agree that in order to serve the public interest purpose, it is um, important to reduce the availability to reduce consumption and harm at a stage where that isn't as, uh, the case in Scotland, then there would be uh, possibly a different requirement from the licensing regime. I want to go back to, Dr. Uh, to Ms Watson's point about boards uh, uh, have no uh, remit to reduce consumption. And I go back to the point that I made earlier to Dr. Scott around about the separation of boards as quasi-judicial bodies from local authorities. Um, and then, Ms. Watson, you talked about a multi-agency approach. But at this moment in time, because of that scenario where it's not up to boards to reduce consumption, how can that multi-agency approach be taken and then brought forward by boards? Well, it seems to me that there are a number of licensing offences, including being drunk on licensed premises, serving a drunk person, and yet because of the difficulties in interpreting what drunk means legally, these offences are very infrequently prosecuted. We've certainly, in the West Lothian Board, only seen two cases in the last five years of licence holders being prosecuted for licensing offences. And yet, when you take that with the CCTV evidence that we've seen at boards of drunk people staggering out of nightclubs at two and three in the morning, then you know, the two things don't add up. So I've certainly had personal um, knowledge of cases where a procurator fiscal has decided that it's not in the public interest to prosecute a licensing offence. So I think attitudes need to be changed, and I don't think that. While I think that whilst boards can play their part, I don't think that um, it's it's for boards to reduce consumption on Do, their own. Does the West Lothian board go out with the police and actually visit premises? Yes, we have on occasion. Yes. Uh, how often? In every board cycle. So that's once every four or five years. Yes. But there are inherent difficulties with that as well, because there are difficulties at particular premises, which then comes before the board in, in a review, and a member takes something into account that he's seen on a night when he's been out with the police, rather than a night that we're talking about in the review. Then all these things are legally challengeable if they're said. I, I, I want to play devil's advocate, Miss Watson, and I, I'm sorry, it seems that we, we keep coming back to yourself. Um, but in terms of uh, the objectives, the licensing objectives, uh, number four is protecting and improving uh, public health. Don't you think that overconsumption comes into to that scenario of protecting <coughs> and improving public health? And therefore, do you not think that boards themselves should have um, a, a, an interest in that overconsumption issue? Yes, I do. I do think that they should have an interest. And I think that if people were prosecuted for these offences, then the way that the legislation is set up, the board should be notified if people have been prosecuted, licence holders have been prosecuted for selling drink to drunk people. And then they should be able to take appropriate action. But what we have found is there have been a number of reviews for late night premises where there have been CCTV evidence of a lot of drunk people milling around. And yet when the lawyers representing the licence holder asked the police, was anyone ever prosecuted? The answer is no. Surely that's one of the reasons why maybe the board should be a bit more proactive in actually going out with the police to see what's going on, because uh, that maybe changed the, the attitudes there, would it not? Yes, but I think the answer is that it's going on everywhere. It's going on everywhere in every street where there are licensed premises. When the sun goes down, and we, and we all know that, and it's become socially acceptable. Uh, Dr Scott, please. 
I think it's also important to remember that environments influence behaviour and making healthy choices, easy choices, again from a population health perspective, is um, often the best way to achieve good population averages, but also um, to narrow inequalities. And we know it's some of our most deprived citizens that are particularly affected um, by alcohol-related harm, or there's certainly a deprivation gradient. So again, from um, an inequalities perspective, the levers that boards have at their uh, discretion in terms of reducing availability are the best way to narrow inequalities as well as reducing overall harm. So this idea of creating healthy environments, I think boards you know, have some powers there and perhaps they're just not being used as effectively as they could. And in addition, if I just may say one final thing about social norms, because I think that's something that's coming out quite strongly in um, uh, Miss Watson's evidence. Availability has an impact on social norms. It's not just about physical availability, it's about price competition and in addition it's about social norms. <coughs> John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Just, sorry, Ms Watson, I just want to try and uh, tease out an answer to a point you raised and that's the issue about boards and the evidence presented to boards. Now, one of the questions that's come up in terms of this legislation is the issue of police intelligence being presented to boards. Uh, but tied into your comment about the con level of convictions that take place in licensed premises. Now, there was a, a national newspaper reported yesterday that a premises in a particular West of Scotland local authority area, there's 94 visits by the police to those premises and the board finally decided to take action. Uh, could you give any examples of where police have tried to take action against a licensee and the courts have been reluctant to actually prosecute. Ms. Watson? I'm, I'm afraid I can't because I don't know what cases are none, referred none for in prosecution. None in, West, none in West Lothian. Well, I wouldn't know what was referred for prosecution. All I can talk to you about is what happens when there's a review of a licence in West Lothian. And certainly, in a number, we've had a number of reviews recently of late night premises. And there, in, in all of the cases, there have been very few cases referred for prosecution, and those that have been referred for prosecution, not all have, have resulted in a prosecution. But, but in terms of the police notifying the board of a potential prosecution or court action, is there no uh, coordinated approach between the police and the board that the police actually indicate or notify the board? that our licensee or premises have been uh, re uh, reported to Procurator Fiscal for court action? Yes, um, the legislation allows for the police to ask for a review and often in a review application there will be reference to the matter, at least some of the matters that, that are un under review being re referred for prosecution. And then of course there's a difficulty that the board has to then raise with the Procurator Fiscal Service to see whether we can have a hearing um, about it, given that it was potentially sub judice, and we can't ask people to come and um, force them to speak about matters which they have pled not guilty to in a criminal court. Right, thank you. Claire Adamson, please. <coughs> thank you, Camila. Um, given that the commercial viability of premises and, and the difficulties that are caused in terms of um, what's been said about the licensing and boards, um, and the effect that a large supermarket can have on an area. C can I ask if any consideration has been given to how minimum unit pricing of alcohol might change that situation and if licensing boards on any um, consideration of that? And also just whether, um, given that we've been talking about consumption, whether minimum unit of alcohol was the opinion that that would reduce consumption? Um, sh shall we start with Dr Shipton first and work down, please? Um, I probably can't speak to how the licensing boards have uh, acted in, in terms of the possibility of minimum unit pricing coming on. I think um, it's uh, for us the, there is a lot of evidence, overwhelming evidence, that minimum unit pricing would reduce consumption. In terms of uh, the licensing availability, what we have, if we have a, a high density of availability, it, it reduces its price competition locally, and that will drive price down. So in terms of minimum unit pricing, that will help to... Um, uh, prevent some of that happening at the local level. So that's something that we would welcome. Dr Scott. 
Again, I can't comment on uh, the impact of minimum unit pricing specifically on supermarkets, but what we can say is that the most recent um, monitoring and evaluation of Scotland's um, alcohol strategy report shows that the difference in <coughs> say, the available sales data between England and Wales and Scotland shows that it's driven by about 72% off sales, and within that, um, cheaper spirits are a big um, bulk of that sale. So minimum unit pricing, there's fantastic evidence around price as a, a good lever for reducing population levels of consumption and therefore harm and it's likely to have an impact on that area of sales. Ms Thompson. Yep, from an alcohol and drug perspective we wholly support minimum unit pricing for the reasons cited there in terms of both um, price and availability of alcohol have very very strong evidence base to support reductions in population consumption and reduce harm. And Ms Watson, please. Yes, um, during our discussions with the board in relation to the policy statement, um, we did touch on minimum unit pricing and they were very much in favour of it. Our board are also very concerned about um, the, the way that some of the trade have found around the, the legislation which was supposed to prevent happy hours in that the legislation I think is quite complex if you look at at uh, the, the condition, it talks about price variations, it doesn't talk about price reductions and some premises in our area have just brought in cheap, cheaper types of alcohol which aren't normally on sale so they're not reducing the price, they're not varying the price but they're bringing in for example Glen's vodka at £1 a shot rather than Smirnoff at two twenty, and that's how they found the way around it and I think that definitely needs to be tightened up. Claire? Okay. Thank you. Alec Rowley, please. Could I maybe pick up on, on a number of points? Can, can I pick up on this, this, this point about on and off licences? Um, because we did hear last week for the licensing trade, and I know that a number of pubs, for example, would point to figures that show that I think I saw that I read that a number of pints being consumed in Scotland had fell massively, but the amount of alcohol being consumed, so, and we see a lot of pubs um, closing. So is there, is there some, a, a difference to, to be looked at there um, in terms of off sales versus the local pub? Uh, can we start with Miss Thompson, please? Yeah, I mean, certainly within um, the over-provision assessment, we looked at on-sales and off-sales and also looked at capacity and looked at the period between 2010 and 2013 to look at where the growth was. And it wasn't on the on-sales, it was in the off-sales. So again, my point clearly is it's important to consider your evidence so that when you're reviewing what's happening or required to happen in a local area, you have that vital information to hand. Uh, Ms Watson, please. Yes, um, certainly we've had evidence at our board that um, a number of um, late-night premises have been struggling recently as a result of people pre-loading before the drinking at home before they go in, going out very late, um, and that alcohol is freely available both from the big supermarkets and online. Uh, Dr Shipton, please. Um, I think I would just add that there are obviously uh, different uh, requirements or different issues with on and off sales and I do agree with Ms Thompson so the the off sales the the difference in price between on and off has widened and that has been driving the general increase in availability we've had we've had 60% increase in availability of alcohol since the 1960s in Scotland so it's been become a lot more uh, affordable and that's driven by the off sales so that's something that locally needs to be looked at in terms of on sales uh, there would obviously be evidence around for, for local areas around on sales and a more, a more generic comment would be that on sales is also contributing to the social norm so if you have a very high provision of that that's dictating what's available in that area to do so that's something that locally may need to be looked at too. And Dr Scott, please. Yeah, I agree that both off and on sales contribute to availability and good data for both would help us um, have a more nuanced assessment. So going back to my initial point um, in my submission, um, I think we need to retain the need to look at number and capacity of outlets. It would be good to have a capacity-weighted number of outlets and look at that in terms of population density. Um, and we could look at that, we could subdivide that by off and on sales. Alec, please. I pick up that there's there's a, a real sort of mix 
out there of what data is available, what licensing boards are taking what into consideration. It may be convener that, that we can ask for for some some of the best practice. I think there's a suggestion that there is good practice and it may be that we can ask the witnesses exactly. to, to to make that available. Um, I saw somebody in their evidence was talking about the community planning partnerships and the ADP's roles in that. Again, is that something that you think, you know, could could um, improve the situation? Who wants to have a crack at that, Dr. Shipton first? Um, I think there is, um, notwithstanding the comments of the separation between the licensing board and the local authority, I think for this process to be very effective, there needs to be some working with the other planning structures, community planning or land planning structures. For, um, for this process to work um, appropriately. And in some areas, I think that does work very well. In some of the review, um, uh, the po policy statements, there is reference to the single outcome agreements, etc. I think which I think is appropriate to, to allow a, a more joined up working within this re regime. Dr. Scott? Yeah, I think there's a synergy between the um, licensing board objectives and what community planning partners are trying to achieve, and I think both would be strengthened by um, greater um, consideration of each other's um, objectives. So I think it would be good not just for boards to have stronger links with ADPs, but with the wider community planning um, infrastructure. Uh, Ms Thompson? Yep. Um, from an ADP perspective, we directly report into community planning in terms of the delivery of uh, seven national outcomes. And the, as uh, Dr Scott had highlighted, there is synergy between um, the licensing in terms of the licensing policy statement over provision assessment. We ha clearly have that um, embedded within our delivery plan and therefore report annually to the community planning partnership and how we're progressing with that in terms of taking forward support and evidence in relation to the over provision assessment, etc. Uh, Ms Watson? I don't have any, any knowledge of community planning partnerships. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, again, convener, it may be that this is an area that we need to explore, given that we are looking at, for example, the Community Empowerment Bill and the role of community planning partnerships. And from a licensing committee point of view, we, there seems to be that there's not a lot of link in there. You would expect, I assume, the ADPs would have the kind of information that would be very useful, I assume, for licensing boards when looking at over-provision. And, and I think perhaps that's an area I just flag up for us moving forward. I did notice um, the other week there that the Scottish Government at one point were talking about a social responsibility tax, um, which would be some kind of power. I did ask the Finance Secretary um, last week if there any intentions of bringing anything forward on that. But I just wonder about the funding, because the idea of some kind of social responsibility tax is that, that a local authority would be able to, say, put a penny on a bottle of wine or whatever is a social responsibility tax, that money that could be then reinvested. And I, I just wonder the funding of the ADPs and a lot of the third sector out there seems to be where a lot of the work is being done in supporting people with alcohol and drugs problems. Is there a is there a, a gap in funding? You know, is, is 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 the issues certainly the issues of alcoholism and, and, and alcohol problems seem to be getting worse? Is there is there a available funding to try and support people? We're beginning to go out of scope, but I'm going to allow this because I think it's I think it's necessary to get the answers to this. Uh, Ms. Thompson, please. There is funding available, and it's directly provided by government for alcohol and drugs to address alcohol and drugs problems in the area. Um, I think the issue is always coming back to the the evidence. Um, you know, there is a great need in terms of individuals being supported in relation to alcohol problems at the moment. We we know that probably about. 25% uh, of people, and that's been through a recent study, are accessing alcohol treatment services that need that support. So there is, obviously, within the, the economic constraints that we're all facing at the moment, there's generally never enough money to, to obviously um, support or when you're looking at true uh, unmet need. 
but we do within our plan in terms of there's funding within the ADP, all the partners, there's direct mainstream funding, there's also funding directly from the council and through other budgets in terms of prevention, early intervention. We clearly de define what those budgets are, how they're spent across prevention and early intervention treatment, supporting people into recovery. So uh, we have a financial framework in place that details that spend. Dr Scott, please. I think it's a perennial tension um, from a preventative medicine point of view in meeting the needs of raging fires or immediate problems and carving out a little bit of money that's about primary prevention and stopping coals that aren't yet lit from becoming raging go, yeah. fires, if you'll excuse the analogy. So I can see the attraction of a social responsibility levy um, and as we've already indicated price is a very good way um, to uh, reduce availability so increasing the prices we have done with tobacco will have an impact on sales consumption and therefore harm and if that money could be ring fenced for preventative medicine all to uh, the better. Uh, Dr Shipton. Um, on linked to this I think there's also a uh, uh, a possibility of looking at the fees, trying to recoup some of the costs. So down in England, they have a late night um, levy. We heard about the premises where police would take um, calls to the premise lots and lots of times. Um, there's a possibility um, of, and in, in several other countries, they explore this idea of the, the licensing fees um, being um, directly related to the harms that might be caused by uh, the sale of the product from that premises. So I think that's something that can be explored. We have a, a large public sector bill in terms of um, paying for the cost of overconsumption. And so that if that could be recouped in some way, I think that would be uh, something worth exploring. Ms Watson? Again, this is out with my area of expertise. OK. I think Alex? just just two quick points. Just I'd want to make a comment on um, the point that, that the Order Watch made. Last week it was made pretty clear to us for people from the licensing trade that there is a conflict where you have large supermarkets wanting to come into an area and set up a supermarket in an area and there may well be an over provision but licensing boards, I think it was put, who's, who, who's sitting there that's wanting to get re-elected going to refuse a supermarket with hundreds of jobs? And that seems to be a tension, I think, that certainly has been brought forward to us in terms of over-provision that we need to look at. But my final question would be, I know you broadly welcome um, the proposals that are in here, but you know, if you were a policy maker and you were looking at this, what, what's missing? What would, you, what would be top of your agenda? Uh, Dr Shipton, please. For us, it would be the issue of accountability and um, transparency. Uh, currently, we'd say that there is no oversight, independent oversight of the licensing uh, boards, um, how they perform or how they carry out the functions. We don't have any outcomes or monitoring data that's reported. There's no review of performance internally by the licensing boards or externally. We know that um, licensing boards were are required to produce a policy and over, over provision statement and also a public register of licensing data. Six months after the deadline, 11 licensing uh, license board statements were still not published and 17 um, over provision statements not published and that's out of 40 licensing boards using more recently using standard online searching mechanisms we found 13 um, public registers of uh, licensing data again that's out of 40 so given it's a, a policy driven process not having a policy has huge implications for how the policy how the licensing board can function in terms of the information deficit this is absolutely key to monitoring performance locally and nationally so without that we have an accountability deficit you heard from the Edinburgh researchers and also the Health Scotland evaluation had to put in a freedom of information request to get the data that they required and we think it's uh, unlikely that stakeholders can, can regularly put in freedom of information requests to get that. So we would ask, as with others actually, uh, for, for two main uh, outcomes here. One is to have outcomes data reported and we're asking for data that the licensing boards have through their um, uh, um, the application process, so not asking for any extra data. The data that they would have needs to be collated and made publicly available um, and a duty to annually uh, report on their performance, the performance against um, outcome measures but also more importantly the performance against their policy statements. We have no way of identifying that. They would be the two things that we would really push for. Dr Scott, please. In complete agreement with what Dr Shipton has just said, I think we need much better data on um, the decisions that are being made, on the numbers of licences, on their capacity, on their 
opening hours and that should all be uh, freely available for members of the public as the electorate is who, who the boards are ultimately accountable to and um, I think a, an annual report would be very useful. I think a, a public consideration of how decisions have achieved or not achieved the board's objectives would also be very helpful. Just one final thing in terms of the tension between economic regeneration and um, sort of public health perspective around the licensing board objectives. I think it's really important to remember that it's not just work that's good for health, it's good work that's good for health. And I think there has to be some consideration of the types of jobs that are being brought into the economy as well. And there's no evidence that increasing um, licences, whether it be through off-sales, large supermarkets or elsewhere, have a net benefit. In fact, when we hear about three to possibly five billion worth of costs to the economy, I might suggest that it's an overall economic dream. Okay. Ms Thompson, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would also agree with Dr Shipton and Dr Scott in relation to improving the accountability and transparency of licensing boards, particularly in relation to how and what evidence is considered and also who is consulted. Published policy statements underpinned by evidence to promote the licensing objectives provide clear guide to licensing practice and supports consistent and well-reasoned decision-making that makes the licensing process more transparent. It's important, I think, that, that licensing boards do publish an annual report. This could be considered at the joint meeting of the licensing forum, and as we know, the licensing forum is there to keep under the review the way the licensing board exercises its functions. So that would be a key opportunity to show how the licensing board is exercising its functions with regard to the Licensing Act and promoting the licensing objectives. Ms Watson. You know, I would like the guidance to be um, looked at and to be much more clear and also the powers of the board to refuse applications to be much clearer to take into account the issues that uh, members have discussed. In terms of section 55 of the bill, 55.4, uh, 55 looks at the annual financial report, but 55.4 says a report under this section may also include such other information about the exercise of the licensing board's function as they consider appropriate. And you think that these uh, issues should be brought up under that section, do you? I think it's probably worth um, being quite explicit because currently under the 2005 Act, as I say, we have um, uh, licensing boards are required to produce a public register of licensing data. That um, hasn't been, isn't being efficient in that one, not all licensing boards seem to have uh, an accessible register and the data that's in there is not appropriate for monitoring. So I think it's great that that is in there, but I think there'd need to be more guidance. These out. Exactly. Okay, thank you very much. One other point before we move away from some of the, the, the points that uh, uh, Mr Rowley has, has raised. It would be very good for us if you could provide us with uh, good and bad practice as you see it. Um, beyond that, um, uh, Ms Watson, I understand that every year licensing boards uh, get together in some conference, shindig or whatever it may be. Is good practice actually shared at, at these events? You mean the Alcohol Focus Conference? Is that what it's called? I have no idea what it's called. I've never been to one. <laughs> Dr Shipton, if you want to come in. Well, the, um, possibly the, the conference, the, the license, uh, Alcohol Focus Scotland, license, there's quite a few licensing conferences. I think it's one run by Alcohol no, Focus Scotland. So. I think no? it's a different one. Okay, we'll leave that then. Um, uh, and uh, finally, uh, on, on that point, and these points that Mr Riley has been uh, making. Is it a real problem, the fact that licensing boards are quasi-judicial bodies that seem to be apart um, from other, other things like community planning partnerships? A yes or no answer would suffice. If you don't have any comment, that's also fine. Dr Shipton? The legal side of the separation of it. So I, I think I'd, I'd struggle to, to uh, talk to the, the details of that. I think there needs to be some working together exactly how that happens in, in accommodating the legal side. I'm afraid I can't comment on that. But the legal side may cause barriers. Uh, Ms Watson, you're probably the expert in the quasi-judicial -jud aspect. Except I don't really know how anything else works. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's uh, very honest. Uh, all, all I can say is that, that every decision that a licensing board takes, whilst it's not open to scrutiny um, by alcohol focus and others, is open to scrutiny by the courts. 
And when the courts deal with a licensing matter, all they do, they don't know about how it works. They just look at the law and look at the words used, and the words used need to be tightened up. Okay. Um, accountancy and transparency, before we move off of that, um, licensing board are supposed to take all of their uh, decisions in public, but often there are uh, backroom discussions on certain points. Do you think that should stop, Ms Watson? No, I think that's essential, that there... That there, is a pot, uh, that there is a forum where discussions can take place, where legal advice can be given in private, as long as it's reiterated in public and parties have an opportunity to comment and on that. And do you that. think it's only legal advice that's given in private at boards? It is on my watch. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have a comment on that? Dr Scott? I don't think... I, well, I mean, I prefer it to be done in public, but I can see, you know... Perhaps there could be some justification. But if we had an annual report which was detailing decision-making, the rationale for that decision-making and how it contributes to the objectives, I think that would provide a level of comfort for us in terms of the accountability. Grant, thank you. Anne McTaggart, please. Thanks, convener. Um, really, just to go back to a point that was mentioned way, way back at the beginning, it was about the proposal to create a criminal offence of supplying alcohol to someone un under the age of 18 in a public place. Do you think that goes far enough? I know some, one of you has mentioned it at your opening speech, but do you think it goes far enough? Let's start with Miss Thompson, please. Um, this will be more about how that's enforced, but I think it does go far enough. I think it's very, very welcome um, in, in, in the context of what's been welcomed by Police Scotland in terms of the conversations that we've had. Uh, and in terms of how it will go far enough, it will be about the enforcement of that. Uh, Dr Scott, please. I don't think I'm sure as to how it could go further. I mean, I probably also welcome it. I think these things send a strong message as to what is and isn't acceptable. Um, I suppose I'd be interested to hear what the further step might be, um, but it, it's a starting point. And Dr Shipton, please. I, I would agree. I, I'd probably want to know the other steps before um, uh, discussing those. I agree. I, wel I welcome it, and it seems to be... So you do, you do think what's been, what is proposed just now, then, is... is it's fine, it's, it's essential, it'll do the job. Dr Shipton? From my understanding, it was also a response from the police um, in terms of in, you could take away alcohol, um, but it could then equally be supplied again. So it, it seemed to me a, a response to uh, difficulties that police were having around this area. Maybe other areas too. Ms Watson, please. How it will be enforced in practice and whether there are sufficient... Um, members of Police Scotland to enforce all of the various licensing offences. As I've said before, I, I just see that these are not being enforced. OK. Um, Anne? No, that's me, thank you. Uh, Willie Coffey, please. Thank you. Yeah, and good morning to you. Can I pick up again on this accountability transparency issue that, that all of the panel members have, have offered some contributions on? Um, and it's to talk really about over-provision and where and whether it should be defined and who should define exactly what we mean. We heard from Mr Wilson's questions that there's quite a variation across Scotland. Wherever you go, you'll see different circumstances in place. And I think, was it Dr Shipton, you mentioned the Western Isles, had some clear definitions, I think, that applied locally. Who should define what over-provision means in a locality? Should it be on the face of this bill? Or should the bill say that it should be defined and it's perhaps the board that should define it? Who's best placed to, to define what we mean by over-provision, do you think? OK. Dr Shipton, do you want to go first? Um, I think it's, um, uh, it's right that it's part of the Licensing Board's policy uh, statement and, and, uh, to, to define what over-provision is. I think in order to... Uh, or the, what over-provision is for their particular area, in terms of how it is um, uh, defined, it probably would be quite good to have a, a national steer on that uh, and, and support and greater guidance around exactly what that is. We know the current um, uh, guidance for the 2005 Act is quite ambiguous around the, type, the level of evidence um, that is required for over-provision, and that has um, uh, uh, made it quite challenging for some local authorities, that, um, uh, some uh, uh, licensing boards, um, to, to uh, evidence the, the over-provision in their area. So I think uh, there is an, uh, a need for all stakeholders to... Uh, 
support the licensing board in order to develop that in terms of supporting evidence, providing evidence, and a national steer in terms of how that's done. Um, Alcohol Focus Scotland has a, has a toolkit for that, but I think, so that's helpful, but I think it does need to come from a national steer as well. Uh, Dr Scott, please. Yeah, I would agree it probably does need some national guidance. I think it's a very tricky concept. As I've already said, I think you can consider it in terms of availability. So weighted for capacity, number of outlets and the density of those outlets, or you can consider it in terms of harm. From a community empowerment perspective, I think it's about engaging the community and having them fully informed and um, thinking about what harm they would consider acceptable and what cost they'd be willing to pay for that harm and being able to re relate that to availability and understanding that evidence. And Further to that, I think, though, the issues about geographical boundaries and the difficulty there, because one, the, the, uh, the geographical area that one board um, serves is clearly boundaried, and where the boundary is, you could have an area that's fantastic in terms of its over-provision um, assessment and uh, regulation, and another that isn't at the boundary, you can't control that. So there's something about a national perspective on it all as well. Before I take in anyone else, um, there's uh, a little bit of confusion in, in my own head round about the guidance that you're talking about um, and at the end of the day courts will make decisions if they think licensing boards are in the wrong if um, there's a set of guidance which says one thing how, how likely is it that the courts will overrule guidance which is not legislation and not in the face of the bill as Mr Coffey has said. Ms Watson, you're probably best placed to answer that. Well, the, the Act says that we must follow the guidance in, in doing our job and taking decisions in the licensing board. So I think the courts would welcome more detailed guidance. And they would take cognizance of that guidance? I think so. I mean, in terms basic, of their decision basically making? Basically, the members of the board are local authority elected representatives. They're not specialists in any of the, the matters that my colleagues are. Neither am I. I'm a lawyer, so I'm advising them. I can only look at what the guidance says. And it seems to me, certainly in West Lothian, that the people that we've asked for the evidence have struggled to know what sort of evidence we're looking for. And I think that, that needs to come from government. OK. Uh, Ms Thompson, I'm sorry about... No, that's, that's fine. Um, just to also concur, I think that the guide should be strengthened in terms of relation to over-provision and particularly around the data that can be used to make that evidence, that assessment of the evidence. That helps the board to make that decision and I think across areas what we've seen in Scotland is that the extent to which public health data is used in practice continues to be subject to varying interpretations of the evidence by licensing boards and the licensing policy outcome there does not always reflect the health evidence presented. So from, from our perspective, we have actively um, engaged in terms of licensing board about the data that we would be looking to provide and also look to consult with our local communities about over-provisioning. And I think that's vitally important because you can have the statistics there in hand, but you also need the community views as well, and I think that's what's been very good in terms of engaging discussion. Thank you. Willie, please. Yep, thanks again, convener. Um, if, if we don't get clear or rigorous national guidance uh, along the lines that you're, you're hoping for or expecting, should the bill then make a requirement that it must be defined locally? Because I think, Janice Thompson, you were saying that it's OK, or rather you would like to see boards reporting and summarising how they came to their decisions, for example. If, Sorry, Billy. I thought you'd finished. Go no, on. No, no. Uh, but if, if the public licensees and the public don't know the criteria that was applied that allowed that decision to be made, have they still got an issue there? Should people be able to see that part of the process? Just what the different criteria yeah. may be? Because it could be different across Scotland. I mean, the, the, the issue will always be about how areas assess over provision and the evidence that is then considered in relation to alcohol-related harm and also additional evidence in terms of capacity of licensed premises, availability of licensed premises across the area. And it will be down to licensing boards to make, finally make that decision. We can provide the evidence and make the recommendations about what we think designates because of the health indicators, the alcohol-related crime indicators, and what the public are saying, we would actually make our recommendations to the board, and then it's down for the board um, 
to consider that and then but because we provided the evidence we would be looking for then the board to justify yes we're taking on that recommendation or why it isn't they're taking on that recommendation because this is it's a transparent two-way process the licensees locally and the public locally be able to see in advance what over over provision means in their locality uh, yeah absolutely um, well it's yes a clear statement there's, there is a clear it. statement the board mm -hmm. must provide um, or circulate a, for comment and co consultation a draft over provision assessment um, that has to go out so that people have the opportunity to see that and certainly we've also engaged the public in, in the wider discussions about alcohol availability in their area as, as a precursor to the evidence as well. Mm -hmm. okay. And could I have one last yes, final question? Yes, of course. I mean, Dr Scott, you were, in your opening remarks, you were, you were saying that you're here to argue for the retention of the numbers and capacity elements. Do you, do you foresee any circumstances where a board would, would not include issues about numbers and capacity if, a, if they were assessing over provision? Are you worried that they might... That. Yes, I would be worried, just given the variation in practice that already exists. And, you know, I suppose it's not an insubstantial, um, it's not an insubstantial thing to have to collate and gather. And we already don't have a database, you know, that second step that would be very useful. So I would be concerned that it might not. And, uh, you know, as, as I think as Dr Shipton's already indicated, a number of policy statements state that areas are over provided for with no backup of you know how they've come to that conclusion or you know what they've considered so um i think it's really essential that it remains a must rather than a may okay um i've got a number of other questions uh, i hope you're okay with with that I, I want to extend this a little bit if i possibly can and get everything in claire adamson please thank you convener um at our session last week um there was representation made about um, changes in the way um, private clubs, members clubs were operating and that because they are subject to a less vigorous regime than an on-trade pub or club um, that um, this occasional licences and, and, and these areas may have an impact and um, that these situations aren't considered when over provision has been looked at by the licensing boards. So I'd just like to get your, your comments and view on that. And Ms Watson? Well, as we don't have an over provision policy because we never got the evidence, it's difficult for me to talk about that. But I can say that there are a number of members clubs in West Lothian which do um, cater for the needs of a number of people in, in the more rural areas. Uh, Ms Thompson? Yep, um, the East Central Alcohol and Drug Partnership has concerns regarding the rules and use of occasional licences. The current rules create a loophole enabling legal requirements of fully licensed premises to be bypassed. This allows commercial premises to be run under a series of occasional licences and is inequitable to permanent licensed premises. Furthermore, it can increase the availability of alcohol in an area that is not presently taken into account for over provision assessment purposes. We would advocate that both members, clubs and occasional licences need to be included in the over-provision assessment as they both increase the availability of alcohol. Thank you. Uh, Dr Scott? Yes, I, you know, I agree. I think it's the aggregate level of availability that you want to consider and you want that assessment to be as robust as possible. So every um, uh, contributor to that availability should be considered. And I understand that occasional licences are not insubstantial and anecdotally potentially have an impact in terms of young people in our um, area. And Dr Shipton, please. I would agree with both of those that they need to be included in the over-provision um, assessment. Thank you. Yes, Claire? Just a supplementary yeah, on that. Um, uh, in terms of, um, obviously, you can't comment on over-provision, could you give us an indication of, of, have you seen a change in the increase in the numbers of occasional licences that are coming from, forward Ms. from members' clubs? Ms Watson? Yes, I have, and that's, that's been um, over the last year and due largely to Police Scotland taking an interest in members' clubs and how they're run. Uh, it would appear um, anecdotally that there has been a number of a number of these clubs have been effectively running as if they weren't members' clubs and the police have been telling them that they need to get occasional licences when they're opening their doors to everyone, which they do at this time of year in particular. So on, on the one hand, it's actually 
allowing them to operate legally. But on the other hand, I can see that from an over-provision problem uh, perspective, then that might be a problem. The other problem that I have is that we we get large numbers of occasional licences and, and and they are very difficult to deal with that in a short time scale. We can't get people to tell us soon enough that they're arranging this event that they've been arranging for months on end and they only come to us at the very end of the process and they only pay a £10 fee. However, that occasional licence can be, we had one recently for a, a school who were running a, a, an event and they wanted to sell drink at half time. Now, if, if that's equated as the same as perhaps 250 people in, in a large uh, venue, then I don't see how you can really count these up and say that they're the same. Um, Dr Shipton, you looked uh, as if you wanted to come in there. I think it comes back to the data. If we have an issue on capacity, um, then, it, then it is something that you could do. What we don't know is how um, license, uh, occasional licences have changed over time. What we're saying is if we could have good outcomes data, this is something that would be publicly available at the click of a button, and we could identify how these have changed over time. And the idea of capacity, we need to get better at um, identifying capacity in, in all types of licences. Claire? Um, surely the definition of a, occasional maybe need to be looked at as well. A school selling alcohol at half time for something is probably very occasional, but uh, by the sounds of what we've been hearing, uh, it's regular rather than occasional in terms of some of the licences for some of these places. Would that be a fair thing to say? Thank you. Uh, John Wilson, please. Just a quick comment on that, convener. The problem is, is that a lot of members' clubs have actually changed their operational structures to allow them to open up to the public because of the, the pressures in terms of the trading pressures to sustainability. Convener, what I wanted to tackle was the issue in terms that's been raised in the West Lothian submission uh, that we received in re relation to minor variation. Uh, and Ms Watson can maybe address this. Uh, within the submission, it raises issues about minor variation to the licensed premises could be an extension or extending an area for the supply of alcohol. Uh, and I'm assuming that would include things like a beer garden. Uh, and it's just to, the, how that relates to, and particularly beer gardens, how that relates to alcohol supply in public places. Because when you walk through, and I've got a, a local example where a local bar decided to stick on a beer garden just in the front of the premises, and they're just next to the shops. Uh, but we've also got a situation in terms of public uh, places in relation to the Glasgow, for instance, uh, during the summer. Every bar in Buchanan Street, Socky Hall Street, Gordon Street, Ingram Street seems to want to open up a public, what would effectively be, in my mind, a public place for the consumption of alcohol. How does that equate with responsible drinking and also the promotion of responsible drinking, particularly for those under the age of 18? Because surely one of the issues that we should be trying to address in all of this is the responsible consumption of alcohol, <coughs> not the total abolition or uh, the promoting temperance might, while it might be worth, worthy cause to actually promote. Uh, but surely we should be trying to, in some way, promote responsible alcohol consumption, and surely that starts before the age of 18. Ms Watson? Yes, um, in, in my submission, there was a, a, an example of a recent um, variation which crossed my desk, and it did make me think that perhaps the people in the area who would have been notified had it been a major variation may have been interested in objecting to what was the extension of outside drinking. But because the way the legislation is written and because they already had a small outside drinking area and they weren't seeking to increase their capacity, because effectively on a good day they wanted everyone outside rather than everyone inside, then it fell under the term of a minor variation and not a major variation, and yet that's contrasted with um, an off-sales premises who want to open earlier than licensed hours. That is a major variation and has to be advertised, and yet 
when we've advertised these recently, people have written in objecting and saying they're objecting to the sale of alcohol, but it's not the sale of alcohol isn't changing, it's only the opening hours of the convenience store. So I think there is an issue, and that should be looked at. Does anyone else wish to comment on that? Dr Scott, please. Um, just that it, it's, it's a, a, a potential increase of capacity. So if we were thinking about the aggregate amount of licences for every application and its contribution in terms of additional capacity, then um, it would... You know, it could be considered from a public health perspective and from the objective perspective. And in terms of social norms, the more availability you have, the greater the social norm. So from a young person perspective, yes, I would agree that's a concern. OK. But, uh, to, sorry, convener. Ms Watson just said that the minor variation to the application was to accommodate the existing clientele rather than increasing the clientele. So have we not got a a contradiction in terms of minor variation in terms of licence. Uh, because if, if and as a, I'm using example of city centres, because city centres, as I said, during the summer, you find that you know, there is a lot of areas that have been opened up, the pedestrianised areas have been opened up for consumption of alcohol. And it's how we get that message over uh, that in terms of minor, and I'm not sure how those premises actually apply for those outside area uh, consumption of alcohol, which, as I said, would argue is a public place, because you're walking through a city centre, it is very much a public place. And how we do that and compare, contrast that with public places versus consumption of alcohol and licensed premises, and what message that sends out to particularly young people and Dr Scott's comment about social norms. Who uh, wants to comment on that? I know it's very difficult because in different areas I think different rules apply in terms of uh, the licensing outside scenarios. Am I right in that? Yes. Uh, Ms Watson? Yes, we have a policy that um, you uh, sh these, pre these areas should only be operated until 9pm. Of course that is only a policy and it, people can apply to open later than that. I think the difficulty is that a lot of the discussions we've had are about applications coming before the board, but the reality is now that licences last forever, some premises just never come to the attention of the board unless through a review. So if, if there's problems at a premises, then we hear about it, and that's the way it's meant to happen. Otherwise, we have to assume that these outside areas are being run properly and that the licence holders are putting in appropriate steps to make sure that there's no underage drinking or no overconsumption in these areas, whether by monitoring by CCTV or staff um, positioned in these areas. Thank you. Anyone else got anything to add there? Dr Shipton. I think it just depends the need for the policy and for um, uh, adherence to the policy. This is where that's, this kind of issue can be um, uh, detailed for a particular local area. OK. Um, finally... Um, there are plans to reintroduce the fit and proper person test. Um, what are your views on that, um, if you have any at all? Um, Dr Shipton, can we start with you, please? Um, yes, we would. I uh, think it's important that um, licensing boards have the ability to determine the suitability of an applicant. Um, and, uh, but we would, uh, our concerns would be around whether the factors that are included are not specified. So we would uh, recommend that in the policy statement, uh, licensing boards identify what factors they would consider relevant, uh, possibly a non-exhaustive list to allow some cl uh, clarity and, and transparency around the issue. Okay, Dr. Scott, please. Yeah, I, I agree that it's reasonable to reintroduce it, and I also think that they should be required to specify the factors that they will consider. In terms of spent convictions, I think that's more of an issue for police and criminal justice colleagues to comment on. Thank you. Ms Thompson, please. I would agree from an alcohol and drug partnership perspective. We would totally agree with the introduction, the introduction of fit and proper persons test, and also that there should be clarity in what that would be what the considerations would be within that. And again, in terms of spent convictions, that should be a matter for Police Scotland or Criminal Justice colleagues to identify. Uh, and Ms Watson? Yes, uh, West Lothian Board wholly supports it. We have some concerns about um, the um, suggestion that Police Scotland might wish to bring forward information that is less than a conviction. 
um, information which it has perhaps come to them um, through different sources, because it is a ground of appeal that um, a decision of the board can be appealed if the board has proceeded on an incorrect material fact. And it's very difficult if you get um, the police saying, well, we think, we think he's done this or we think he's involved in organised crime. All they've got to do is say, we're not, prove it, and then that's a difficulty. Uh, what about the situation where the licence is held by somebody other than the owner of the premises? Again, that's a difficulty. We've, had, we've ex experienced that locally as well. Okay. The, the system seems to have... Ironically, the licence holder is the only person in the system who doesn't need to be trained. The designated premises manager does, but sometimes there's no correlation between the two. And we've, we've had a lot of issues with people who are the de facto manager who aren't the designated premises manager. I think that the definition of designated premises managers needs to be, or premises manager, as it says in the legislation, needs to be looked at so that it is actually the person who's in control of the premises. Thank you very much uh, for your evidence here today. It would be useful if, if you could supply us with uh, uh, best practice and, and bad practice as well, if you have that information. Um, we've run a, a, a fair bit over time, and I thank you uh, for your forbearance. Uh, and I now suspend, uh, and we'll commence again at 11. Thank you.
Um, I'd now like to welcome our second panel of this morning, uh, and they are Jake Adams, Director of JR Adam Limited, uh, Ivor Williamson, Managing Director of Rosefield Sar Salvage Limited, Ian Hetherington, Director General, British Metal Recycling Association, and Joe McCann, Site Manager for Stephen Dalton Scrap Metal Merchant. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, would you like to make any opening remarks at all? Mr. Hetherington. Yes, thank you, convener, and thank you for uh, listening to us today. We appreciate this is a rather different topic than the one you've been dealing with previously. Um, and we also recognize that you will not probably as a group be familiar with the scrap metal industry. Um, so if I just may say a few words about the industry, I mean, uh, um, the recovery and processing of metals from consumer goods and demolished buildings and industrial processes, and more recently and particularly important in Scotland, recovery from the oil industry, um, you know, are a critical part of Scotland's industrial infrastructure. Every tonne of metal that's collected and processed has one destination. It goes into a steelworks or a metalworks and is reprocessed to become what it was in the first place. So it's a perpetual and continuous process. Scottish metal recyclers process in, and sorry, metal recyclers and scrap metal dealers are interchangeable and when we're not, we're not proud or, or worried about either definition. But metal recyclers process in the region of 1.3 million tonnes of metal every year in Scotland. Um, the industry turns over, uh, and this is net turnover, contributes around 500 million to the Scottish economy. And in the current climate, with uh, the demise, really, of the steel industry in Scotland, around 300 million pounds is generated in foreign exchange every year from the sale of of recycled metal to metal works overseas. The industry has a really unusual shape, and this is important, it's relevant to the licensing of it, in that we have around 200,000 Scottish individuals and small businesses and large businesses who sell, who supply scrap to our members every, every year. Um, and our members only sell to somewhere between 200 and 350 customers, as you would traditionally know them. So this is an upside-down industry in that we have multiple suppliers in a very small number of end customers. And what these, this bill sets out to do is to regulate the way that we conduct our business with that large number of suppliers. And so... It, it, it is an unusual practice for a license to, uh, to uh, uh, dictate your buying practices. Licenses would typically dictate how you, how you sell your products or services. Um, the Metal Dealers Bill and the principles in it, our members actively support the intentions and the principles that underlie the Metal Dealers licensing components of this bill. Uh, all the comments we've submitted and all the evidence we'll provide today are aimed at supporting those intentions and strengthening the bill, as well as making it more practical to implement and to enforce. We should make clear also that we do believe the bill could be a great deal clearer um, and that we believe that the enforcement of its provisions in the current form will be extremely difficult for the police and licensing authorities. And, and the crucial point from our point of view will therefore potentially disadvantage law-abiding metal recyclers to the advantage of those who work on the margins of the law. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to add anything at this moment? Well, Mr. Williamson. Our, um, business if possible. My personal business, Mr. Convenia. Uh, Rosefield Salvage is part of the Williamson Group, a, a family owned metal recycling company which was founded in 1923. We're a fourth generation and operating five sites throughout Scotland from Peterhead and Fraserburgh in the north to uh, Addingston and uh, Dumfries in the south. We bought Rosefield Salvage in January 1995 and moved from its existing Dumfries town centre to a fully concreted recycling facility in the edge of town. When we took over the 
the business. It had two employees. I mean, I have ten employees, and I've increased the tonnage from 5,000 tonnes to 25,000 tonnes. And in monetary terms, that's from about £200,000 to £19 million turnover. Um, we have been in the top 20 companies in the Business Insider magazine in the last three years. At present, we have a wide variety of customers, ranging from the small householder who comes in with his poles from his garden shed to alley cans to large multinational companies who dispose of hundreds of tonnes of material a week. The majority of our um, businesses not cash-based, it's account. However, it does represent a smaller number of profitable trades, what we call door trades, where we get about 20 to 40 customers per day who come in and get cash, ranging from a householder disposing of aluminium cans to a plumber disposing of a redundant heating system. These are generally paid in cash for convenience and customer ease, and most customers don't carry ID as such, and we only see them maybe once or twice a year, depending on the nature of the business. At present, we service Dumfries and Galloway in the area, buying both ferrous and non-ferrous metals, which we have large machines that chop and bale the ferrous metal, which is then transported to larger ferrous merchants who generally export it abroad. The higher non-ferrous metals, we um, bale and sort and export abroad ourselves in containers, and obviously, with a new proposal, we hope that tight regulation and strong enforcement would... If there wasn't tight regulation and strong enforcement, it would cause a reduction in business. For obviously, the legislation to work, we want to cut metal theft, but we want to incorporate other companies like car breakers, waste companies and demolition contractors who also deal in the metal industry, who are not regulated the same way. OK. Anyone else? Uh, Mr Adams. Thank you, Mr. Convener, and thank you for the opportunity to discuss this if, with you today. I, I don't want to be a pedant, but if you can just say convener. Convener. Uh, it's a good Scottish term which uh, can apply to a man or a woman. Very <laughs> true, very true. Thank you, Convener. Um, as you said, I'm a director of JR Adam and Sons Limited. We're a family business based in Glasgow. We have two facilities in Glasgow, one in Ayrshire. Um, we employ over 70 employees. We're, we're one of the five exporters in Scotland. We export scrap metal all over the world, steel scrap mainly to Europe to sell on to steel mills, who then remelt it into to reinforcing bar for the construction industry. Um, over the past four years, our turnover has been over £70 million. And in 2009, we won a Queen's Award for Enterprise for International Trade. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, and Mr McCann, do you want to add anything? Basically, what these gentlemen have said, I agree with in many respects. I've been in the industry for 60 years. And uh, yes, there's been a lot of changes. Uh, and what I have seen, some for the good and some for the not so good. In my opinion, the way the licensing has been run, which was said earlier by Mr Williamson, is the fact is that there is an awful lot out there who do not work under the same conditions that we do. And if this is going to have to stop, we've got to look at it. The fact is... How can we stop it and where can we get cooperation? But we don't get cooperation if we're not playing on a level playing field. OK, um, let's start off uh, with a question round about police investigation uh, of, of metal theft. What is your experience of that at this moment in time? Uh, can we start with Mr Williamson, please? Well, generally, if, if, if there's something stolen, the police will normally appear at your premises maybe three or four days later, sometimes even a week later. We've actually had them in six months after a, something's been reported stolen, which obviously makes it very hard to identify if it was in your yard. Um, the generally, I find them not too, too big a problem with it. We, we don't encourage, obviously, MD to send any particular dodginess to come in our yard. But, you know, we, we want to get on with the police, we show them the records, you know, we generally don't have a problem with them. But I think the biggest problem with them is, is the is the lack of um, time it takes them to, from when someone's maybe reported stolen till when they actually come to visit your yard. If we look at some of the thefts that have taken place of, of late, um, in my own neck of the woods in the northeast of Scotland, we've seen um, thefts from railway lines with which put the Aberdeen Inverness line out of action for a farewell. Um, we've seen quite a lot of thefts round about electricity substations. 
if anybody comes into your yard with anything which you think is a bit suspect, um, do you contact the police? Yeah, well, lately the police have been in and we've got a number to contact them locally if the, anything suspect comes in. We've got a text message system that's try and send us quickly. We're working with the police. The, the, the thing you were talking about, the railway line, I mean, I actually think they thought it went abroad with, like, organised crime, which is one of the, the major problems that they're saying that it's obviously coming into the... which could potentially come into the metal business and the waste business, because obviously if you do ban the cash... Organised crime may have an avenue of having cash, you know what I mean, to pay potential people. So that's why we want to try and get everybody under the one bill. OK, Mr Adams? Really just backing up what Mr Williamson said, we, you know, we fully support and cooperate any any police matters with, with theft of material. Sometimes the police are in quite, quite quickly after a theft, a matter of days. Other times it's weeks after the theft has taken place. On a busy day, we, we buy from other merchants, from industry, from demolition industry, from councils, all the way down to householders. So on a busy day, we, we can have 800 tonnes of material going through, going through our yard. So quite often, unfortunately, when the police come in, if it's a couple of weeks later, if there, if there was material that's come in, whether it's been direct from someone who has stolen it or whether it's come in from another merchant who, who has dealt with someone before that, quite often it's unfortunately passed through. The system, but as Mr. Williamson says, anything that's suspected of being being stolen is rejected, and the police are contacted. Uh, Mr. McCann, please. In Edinburgh, and I can only speak for about Edinburgh, we have a system here where you've got the metal broker's license, uh, and there's a rules and conditions which we adhere to. Uh, it tells you what you can what time you can open, what time you shut, what you can buy, and what you can't buy, because there is also a limit on on the, the weights. Uh, we've had this for many years, we've had no problems. The police come in if they want every day, they don't have to go and get themselves a, a warrant. They can come in any time of the day. And in fact, most of the, the members in this camp, they do the same thing. The police can come in any time. And we're quite happy. And yes, we cooperate with the police. Mr Hetherington, please. Yes, I mean, it's worth saying the industry runs a, 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 a metal theft alert system, so we have an online system, so if people notify us of a theft, we then notify all our members. Again, it's down to speed, because if we don't know about it, if people don't tell us within, within hours, then this material gets lost. It is worth saying that, uh, of course, the largest, one of the largest suppliers, for example, of, um, of high-value copper cable in this country to the industry is BT, um, and their, you know, their network renewal program has in large part, a large uh, <coughs> amount of that work has been funded through the sale of, um, of, of surplus cable. Um, so we are seeing a flow of this material. I mean, it's how the electricity companies... Um, you know, uh, Scottish Power, SSE, they sell a large quantity of cable to the industry. And so differentiating between that which is legitimately sold, stolen as part of their project renewal work and that which is, you know, sorry, that is stolen and that is legitimately occurring is sometimes difficult. BT, for example, have really sorted it. And our members now, they are, unless you have a contract with BT, you don't handle BT cable. But lots of these other materials are not easy to identify as stolen. Just because it's cable doesn't mean it's stolen. It's very often arisen. So we work very closely with the network companies and the, uh, and the other um, you know, uh, provisioning companies because if they tighten up their, their disposal routes, then it makes it a lot easier for our members to identify those things that are actually stolen. You say that BT now have contracts and only deal with, you only deal with uh, BT through, through contracts. But surely, even before that system and dealing with other companies, um, surely it would be the case that you would be dealing with representatives of that particular company. I mean, if I use Network Rail as an example rather than BT, because I say BT have tightened up so much over reason. But, I mean, Network Rail under their small works which isn't small by my standards, or um, but their small works contracts are still let through main contractors to something like 400 subcontractors across the UK. And, so, and those may well be subcontracted again. So you get some very small subcontractors handling this material. Um, it isn't just you know, um, network rail or, or even main contractors. Uh, so there is a problem with planned disposal. 
uh, it's getting a lot better and these companies have become more aware of it. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, cash ban, which is part of this bill, um, do you think that that will be successful in removing some of the incentives for metal theft? Mr Williamson? I think it will certainly take away a, a portion of it. I think there is always the, the corner of the trade that is, works outside uh, the legal system. And I think, obviously, if you take the cash away, there will be people historically who have been used to cash, still want to be paid in cash, who will look for another avenue to get rid of their cash. Um, obviously, that's what we want to clamp down. If, if we don't have the cash, we want every other avenue clamped down on as well. We don't want you get waste companies dealing the metal now because obviously the value of it is so much higher. You get demolition companies, you get you get people running around buying catalytic converters off of garages. You know, there's so many different avenues people are paying cash. So I think because the public's been so used to cash, if you suddenly say right, you're getting cheque or paid into your account. And then somebody goes to the garage and says, well, I'm going to give you X amount for this Cadillac and it's in cash. They're going to take it, which is obviously going to hurt the, the, the proper license scrapyard, which is going to hurt our trade as well. And then you're still going to have the, the cash out there. And as I say, the, the worry is that, you know, I've heard rumours down in England that there is a bit of organised crime getting into it because they have a, a, an amount of cash. Um, and obviously we don't want that up here. Okay, Mr. Williams, uh, Mr. Adams, sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, yes, the, the, the bill will help, but it has to be tightened up dramatically. Um, at the moment, the definition of metal has to be tightened up to include, as Mr. Williamson touched on, catalytic converser, converters, waste, waste electrical equipment, end of life vehicles. The definition of a metal dealer has to be tightened up at the moment because the way the bill is written presently. Um, if the, the, metal, the metal dealers will have to adhere to it, but companies, as Mr Williamson touched on, that are on the periphery of the industry, the demolition trade, waste contractors, vehicle dismantlers, at the moment, the way the bill's written, don't have to abide by these, these laws, so there still would be an opportunity for scrap metal to be purchased <coughs> for cash by these industries. Okay. Mr Adams. Uh, Mr McCann, sorry. Sorry, Pete, we're getting, doing well. Basically, um, when it comes to paying cash uh, and the way the bill is written and what they're asking, that it will be paid by cheque. Uh, as you're probably well aware, you can't go into a garage and pull your car up and pay for cheque. It's not allowed. They don't accept it. Same even cards are. Cash is everybody's right. I mean, if you, we are employees, the employees can ask for cash rather than to be paid by cheque. That is their right. It's the same with the scrap industry. If somebody comes in and says, I'm sorry, I don't want to take your cheque, I'd like cash, please. What are you going to do? Do you turn them away? No. You pay them cash. And to criminalise it is totally, totally out of order. Because it means, you want, once you start that, you're going to go into, if somebody walks into Tesco's and asks a question, um, I'm sorry, we're not going to take your cash, we want it by card, but I haven't got a card. You're going into the realms of banking and other things that you don't want to go into. Cash is cash. People's entitled to be paid by cash if they wish. Tighten up the, the, the rules, yes. The gentlemen here, every one of them, everyone in this current period are quite happy for things to be tightened up. We we'll look forward to it. But we must be on a level playing field. As each one of them have said, there's, there's other elements out there. Uh, who will pay cash. So, and then they'll come back in, uh, we buy it, we pay them the cheque, or they go elsewhere, we'll say to the criminal element, do you want that? The answer is no. What you're looking for is back where everybody's on a level playing field. Mr Hetherington? Yes, the industry in Scotland is clear that um, uh, they want a range of provisions in this bill. Um, and that they fully accept that the restrictions on payment are one of are one of a whole suite of, of, of provisions that they would they would support and um, and go along with. So I, I differ uh, with Joe on this one, but uh, yeah, the industry generally is is supportive of of changes with all the provisos that you've heard from my colleagues. Okay. Do you think that uh, stopping cash payments uh, will actually help catch those folks who are in the periphery who are maybe up to some criminal activity? Mr Hetherington? I don't think that changing the law 
uh, unless that, that serves to uh, embrace all those players that you've heard about, um, will we'll not do the job. But if, if, the, if the law, if the bill as, uh, in an amended form actually does cover off the loopholes that we're talking about here, yes, I think it will serve to, to help. I mean, there are other provisions in that bill which we regard as absolutely critical to this process, and that is a reduction in, in, in providing the, the industry providing any outlet for stolen material. That's what we all want. Um, is actually the ID provisions. It's the ID provisions that have actually driven down crime levels of metal theft in certain parts of the country where this has happened, um, and certain parts of England, sorry, where this has happened. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think it is part of a suite of measures which hopefully will bear down on, on criminal activity generally. Thank you. Cameron Buchanan, please. Indeed. As one of the few panel members who has actually been to a scrapyard, I have gained a sort of superficial knowledge of it. The problem I had with cheques was that people could, you could pay them by cheque and then they could go next door somewhere else and cash the cheque. So it was going to be very difficult to stop cheques. Also, I wondered if cash, because cash is a problem, and you keep talking about level playing field, could we have a sort of a maximum amount that people could be paid by cash, like £100, for example? Would that be an idea? There's sort of two questions there, really. I think the cheque thing is quite interesting because cheques are now virtually going out of fashion and you can't catch them. But the ID also is, when I went to the scrapyard, they had photographic ID, and that, I think, would put off some of the non-hardened criminals, because there's photographic ID, they're getting their picture taken, and they don't like that. And I wondered if everybody has that. Mr. Williams, sir? A few questions. Well, we certainly all have CCTV now, and I think all members, you know, when the bill comes in, if you're going to have to ID, you're going to have to take photograph, uh, a copy of their ID, and you'll have them on CCTV. I actually did mention the fact that in a rural area, um, if, if you're up in the Highlands or, and you've got a couple of washing machines that are worth £5, if you're not going to get cash from them, you're just going to throw them beside the road. I actually think it might cause a problem in rural areas, maybe not in the central belt and around the populated areas. But I did suggest, but I think we had a vote at our meeting and I kind of got th thrown down with that one um, because the, I think they were wanting to talk about a complete cash ban because they were worried about potential people you know, coming in ten times in one day, things like that. Um, but I just, it goes back to the point, if the cash is going away, the same as the cheque um, cashing, if somebody gets a cheque, they can go up the local high street and cash the cheque. Personally, I, you know, if I'm issuing a cheque in the future, I wouldn't have one in the same, because you're going to go through all this different legislation for cheque check cashing. So, and it would only work probably in the big cities like Glasgow or Edinburgh anyway. I don't think there's a, a lot of take for it down in the small areas. Um, but it just goes back to the fact that you want to get everybody, nobody paying cash, whereas if you've got a car break or a scrap car and you they say it's worth £100 and it's got five bags of copper in the back of it, it could be worth £500. So it's like all these little loopholes we want to get out. Mr Adams, please. Yeah, really the same as Mr Williamson. Um, the, the photographic ID will, will help dramatically on, on the cheque cashing um, issue in a way going forward, if, if, our, if my business um, issues a cheque and then that customer is able to go to a cheque cashing facility in Glasgow somewhere, I think there's still the, the full identification required by the cheque cashing facility. So there's still the full paper trail and the traceability, which is one of the big issues, so that the material can be traced from, from whichever yard it's been sold to. If it's my yard, that's who the material was bought from. That's the chap's name. And then the cheque cashing facility would still be able to provide identification for the chap who, who cashed the cheque. So that, that, in a way, you know, is a slightly different issue. As, as Mr Williamson touched on, we certainly won't be looking to put cheque cashing facilities on our, on our premises. Ca cash for us is a, is, a, is a hassle. It's an expense and it's a security risk more than anything. Um, so when it, when it goes, it will make our day-to-day -day business easier, easier to run. Mr McCann, please. I actually agree with Mr Adams what he said. It is a hassle cash. But at the same time, it's obviously got to look at the rates. And where I'm coming from is the fact is that when people come in, the registration is taken, their name, address, what time they arrived at. They're on CCTV on three different occasions. As they come into the yard, as they go down to the non first store, and when they come back to be paid, they sign for their cash, and they're also on the CCTV. So running it back is very simple. Yes, we do it. But is everybody else doing it? The answer is no. 
the small mine doesn't have to, to put in all, all this type of equipment, yeah, but which we do. Mr. Hetherington, please. Yes. Um, the, we've dealt with really the issue around checks. In, in terms of a de minimis payment arrangement, uh, this was trialled in France um, and abandoned after six months, and they moved to a full cash ban just because of the the, the it, people getting round it with multiple transactions, and uh, it was impossible to trace. In other words, it, if there's a limit of £100, then all of a sudden there were lots of people seemingly doing four or five 100 pound transactions in a day um, and and it was it was deemed by the industry incidentally as well as by the police in France to be completely unworkable um, and and they the industry in France sought to have it have it um, transferred to a full ban which is now happening. So I wouldn't please. Sorry, I wouldn't agree with that because surely if you had photographic ID you'd see, spot the guy coming in every now and again wouldn't you? Yeah but the problem is unless you then unless you then outlaw multiple transactions, you get into a very complex set of rules and like all of these things, unless the rules, um, the rules I'm saying, unless the law is very, very clear indeed, then it's difficult for industry people to enforce, um, enforce it. It's in difficult also for local authorities, more important for the police uh, to enforce and understand because these become very complex. Okay. Can I just come back here? If I applied the washing machine test, which you gave, if somebody comes to the washing machines and dumps two washing, and they can't get cash, and they just go next door and say, sod it, and dump it in the river, surely there, there should be then a limit on cash for that sort of thing. I mean, it's, it's got to be a bit of sort of common sense on that sort of thing, hasn't it? Well, as you say, say it was £100, the only problem you've got is, say you could come to my yard and get £100 and go to Jake's yard and get another £100 and go to the next yard and get, you know, you could split his load up into three loads and he would have, and they'd go to four or five different yards in the same day. Well, it, it, it's, it's still getting cash out there, and obviously if people are wanting to go and uh, steal material, and they're thinking, well, I can only steal £500, but I'll split it up and sell it to five different yards. I mean, we're not wanting to encourage it. I'm just trying to be a devil's advocate. You're, you, in the north of Scotland, where you've got yeah. rural and less scrap yards, people who obviously historically come in and get money for the metal, they actually, if you say, we can take it, but you're, you're getting nothing the time I do my cheque, and do all the ID, it's worth nothing. They'll just say you're making a fortune and they'll dump it in the way home. Right. Which actually does happen when the price of metal goes down. They, they think you're ending up making a fortune. Um, so it, it's people's perception as well. Okay, thank okay. you. It's fine for me. Uh, John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. And, and just to pick up on the issue of perception, because I think everybody around the table, uh, like the Convener did in terms of the example of the BT or... Uh, network rail and then materials losses but for many of the public it's a brass plaque it's the miners memorial statue that gets stolen and scra you know, for scrap uh, as the main concern how as an industry do you see you challenging that perception that the scrap metal industry is actually supporting that level of crime let's so, start with Mr Hetherington please Yes, I mean, you know, we we share these these uh, the distress that these things um, cause, um, and many of our members are, have been contributors to and subscribe to to some of these monuments. And in fact, in many cases where these thefts have occurred, our members have actually been the people who've raised the money to replace them. Um, it's not out of guilt; it's out of a sense of you know, uh, association. Um, the uh, these are relatively rare. They are deeply distressing. And it's perfectly clear that where a named plaque or a memorial is presented at a responsible um, um, scrap metal yard, that will be rejected by the people there and presumably and quickly reported. I mean, uh, as it happened, the, the outbreak and the most notable series of these outbreaks happened in London, I think, which reached the national press. It turned out to be one yard in South London, and they would, they'd set out in, in a deeply, deeply immoral way to, to collect these things. I mean, the, the, the volumes of metal involved in, in those sorts of theft are so small, the distress caused is enormous, the impact is enormous, but the actual volumes of metal are so small that they are, they're not wanted by any responsible dealer, any dealer. Um, because the, uh, 
one, because of impact and all the rest of it, but two, because the, the volume is small. But, the, I mean, there are things. I mean, church roofs is a classic one, the lead from church roofs, which causes immense community stress and, and distress. Um, now, you know, we've done a lot with the lead industry now to try and control high-grade, heavy-grade um, lead so that our members are aware of the sorts of grades that may come off historic buildings. We, we've actually done a great deal to counter this. Now, I... I, I, I don't say that addresses all the perception issues. That's a longer journey. Um, this bill, incidentally, is part of that journey, in our view. Mr. McCann, please. When people talk about scrap being stolen, it gets out of hand. It's elaborated. It's like a storyteller. I'd say that the members here... They're lucky if it's one half of one half percent stolen metal goes into the yard because they've got too much to lose. And this is where I'm coming from. If you've got too much to lose, you don't take it. It's as simple as that. Or, like saying here in Edinburgh, we've got a system where we turn around, please come in, tell us what, what's went missing, ask to look around the yard, the yard's open to them. We're quite happy with that. In Glasgow, they do something very similar, but they don't have the same rules as we have through here in Edinburgh. So we get a wee bit upset when people turn around and say, ah, the scrappies, they're a bunch of crooks, they're a bunch of nerdy wells. No, I hold my head up. I'm very proud of the scrap industry, very, very proud. And I can go back to when they were called junk men. But this is the point. Everybody thinks that the scrap metal trade is run by crooks. It's not. These, are, these gentlemen here, their families have been in the scrap trade for years and years and years. I mean, I've got 60-odd years' experience in the scrap trade because that's the way we were brought up. You had to learn from the, the bottom, work your way up, and if somebody come in with stolen material, there's the door, or you phone the police. The police come in, they're quite happy. You'll find that the majority of the scrap merchants, the big ones, the police have got no, no problems. How many have you seen in court? None, except myself, I've been in court going way back about 40 odd years ago. But the point is, do you, do you want to, to stop the scrap? If you want to stop the scrap, sit and listen to these chaps. Go around and do it slowly, bit by bit. To pull out where we went wrong. We know where, you, where the, the systems went wrong, but do you listen? No. So that's basically well, where I'm coming from. You're here today for us to listen. So where's the system going wrong, Mr McCann? The systems went wrong because the, the way... Uh, like, say, SEPA and DEFRA, when they produced the waste industry. Now, scrap, to me, look, by the way, these gentlemen don't agree with me, uh, scrap, to me, is a, it's a product. It's not waste. Uh, we've got to process it. We spend a lot of money in equipment. We've got to process it. Uh, even in the waste industry, which I'm also in, the fact is you take the material in, and what you recover going in skips, it goes back into the system. If we weren't doing it, it cost this country a lot of money. At one time, the scrap merchants were blue-eyed boys because we saved the country money because we were recycling. I don't like the word, but I mean, we recycled. Uh, we brought material in that was going to the steelworks, that was going to the brass foundries, and so forth. We saved the country a lot of money. But now, because certain elements are causing problems, it reflects on us all. Unfortunately, with me, I get very passionate about it. Uh, and when I see some of the bills that go through and I read them, I get upset. And I'd rather sit and talk to you and say, look, if you've got a waste carrier's licence, the police stop them, which they've been doing. They stop and say, oh, I've got a waste carrier's licence. OK, on you go. Because they're licensed, we're the ones who have got to take all the flack. We abide by the law. We make sure everything goes well. Well, I think it's uh, up to us to, to try and safeguard le legitimate traders. But the problem that we have, 
Um, and the reason why this bill is in front of us is because there are folk out there who are obviously not trading legitimately. Um, and we have got to ensure um, that the miners' memorials, uh, the railway uh, uh, infrastructure um, and the drain covers, etc., are not disappearing, causing lots and lots of problems. Um, and it's closing down non-legitimate uh, criminal traders that, that we're trying to do here. But, you know, we're here to hear your views. Um, and, you know, you can feed in anything you like. I mean, we're not playing about with this in terms of the scrutiny of this bill. It's up to us to try and make sure that it is as right as it possibly can be, because the last thing that we actually want to do is to revisit it um, at a later date, finding that the problems have not been resolved. Uh, Mr. Adams, please. Yeah, we, we fully support the, the industry. Fully supports it. Convener, going back to the point um, about the brass plaques. Really, t to summarise, in, in my opinion, if the bill goes through as it stands, theft will still occur because these industries that I've already mentioned that are on the periphery of the scrap trade, the metal recycling trade, will fall out with the scope of the bill. So that, and I know there's been a lot in the press recently, particularly in Scotland, um, from SEPA about organised crime in the waste industry. The waste industry is going to fall out with the scope of this bill as it's written. So if the, if the bill passes through as it's written at the moment, it, it, will not, it will not eradicate metal theft. Mr Williamson, please. I fully agree with Mr Adam there. Um, I think Mr McCann was obviously setting out the fact that the, the main bigger scrap yards that you're a, a fixed entity, the police can come in and check your CTC records, your everything. But it's the smaller traders, maybe the itinerant traders that are the ones that are possibly causing problems that are harder to um, police, um, the ones that are maybe on the outskirts of the law who don't want to abide by the law mostly. Um, and that's the ones, obviously, we were a bit worried about. And as, as Mr Adams says, uh, we have to incorporate other businesses, other companies that deal in metal that um, are not under the scope of this bill at the moment. I think it would be very useful um, for the committee if you were to list these dealers for us. Um, so that we can uh, look at that in, in some depth, uh, all of the associated trades that may yeah. be dealing in metal. I think that would be extremely useful if you wanted to do that, maybe via Mr Hetherington's yeah. organisation or, or individually, whatever yeah, it may no be. Uh, Mr Wilson. Thank you, Convener, and thank you for your responses. Uh, and as the Convener outlined, we are here as a committee to listen to your concerns about the legislation, because we need to make sure we get the legislation right, and we need to relay that message to the Scottish Government and part of the evidence session today is allow us to hear what the industry thinks so we can then challenge the Government in terms of what they're putting forward. But Mr McCann, in terms of your submission, uh, written submission to the committee today, you made reference to uh, the separation of waste management licence from the scrap metal brokers licence. Uh, you've raised a concern there about the separation of the licences. Would you want to expand on that today so we can fully understand what you mean by that and what impact that may have in relation to what we're trying to tackle here and the underlying problem of scrap metal theft? The waste licensing, which is done through SEPA, or different, is entirely different from the broker's licence, entirely different. Uh, SEPA's licence... Anybody can go along and apply. There's no real hard and fast rules. But they are the same people, like the, the car breakers. They can open 24-7. We're curtailed 7 in the morning to 5 at night. Saturday to 7 in the morning to 12 o'clock. We cannot buy anything after that. That is us shut down. And we adhere to that. We're quite happy with this. But the other ones, as they say, on the peripheral, they turn around, they can work 24-7. Or they, they walk into a pub. If he's, he's not going to buy the, the scrap uh, by cash, he's going to do it by check. Um, they'll go and they'll sell it elsewhere. And the fact is that because they have got a license from SEPA, and I keep going on about this, is the fact is that they are legalised. They have got a license for recycling. We've got the same license. We, we've got to apply for the same because we've, SEPA still can, can come into our yards and say, we're not happy with this, we're not happy with that. We spend the money. Other ones don't. So we are penalised for material that's going on, it's been stolen and handled. What we are asking for is a level playing field. Now, as I keep saying to you, 
I'm happy with the system we've got with the broker's licence. We've got too much to lose. I mean, if you buy scrap, if scrap is worth a hundred pound a ton, and you buy it at fifty pound a ton over the door, and this, the scrap is stolen, you're charged with reset, and you can you lose your cash, you lose, lose your scrap. In fact, you can lose your licence. That's you, that's your loss. But that applies to us. It doesn't apply to those who've got licences for SEPA. So it's got to be on a level playing field. And that's all I'm asking, is if we can get the people to understand, the people who, who set out the laws, and have a look at it closely, you'll see where there's so many anomalies, it's unbelievable. Mr McCann, you, you made reference, and I'm going to just turn to you, Mr Williamson, because yep. in Mr Williamson's submission, he actually says, and Mr McCann, you made reference there, about potentially a broker could lose their licence. Yep. And Mr Williamson's submission more or less says that a, bro the, a license, if somebody found breaking the licensing conditions on three misdemeanours should be struck off. That gives the impression that the current penalties that are in place and the possibility of losing your licence isn't that uh, strong in terms of the current regulations and legislation. And it would be useful to find out, one, if you think the current fine system uh, or the prosecution system uh, and the licensing system are strong enough to actually deal with the issues. And, I'm, and, and I take on board the points that have been made by the witnesses before us today, that these are all legitimate business people who are carrying out legitimate businesses. But it's how we tackle the illegitimate businesses that are actually causing most of the problems. Uh, because we, as the convener said in his opening remarks, the difficulty is we now hear reports of theft from British Telecom Network Rail. That, and we've seen the footage on the television where it's shipped into the back of a container. The container's, container's shipped off to a port and then it's in China or India before we within a couple of weeks, and it, it's not going through any system in the Scotland or the UK. It's how do we tackle those issues, and how do and how is the trade? Can you assure us that uh, you're fully behind us and looking at the penalties and uh, other opportunities that we have to actually curtail this type of trade? Let's start with Mr Williamson, please. I think what Mr McCann was getting at is there's, there, you need a, a waste carrier's licence for carrying what the class is waste, whether it's rubbish from a building site or scrap metal, which is obviously through SEPA. So SEPA, you can get a licence for, I think it's £140 or something, for three years. So if you're a plumber, you need a waste carrier's licence, a contractor or metal. So obviously a lot of the itinerant and some of the smaller dealers have these carriers, but a lot of the police, it's only recently they've realised that you needed a broker's licence as well to deal in metal. Because obviously I think a lot of the legislation, the police weren't actually up to speed. And obviously SEPA give out a licence for the waste carriers, whereas your local authority give out what they call a metal dealer's licence, which most of us have, or an exemption to a metal dealer's licence. The smaller ones have a broker's licence, which obviously... If we have a metal dealer's licence, we have opening times, times we shut, the times we're there, we're fixed. Whereas, obviously, the, the broker's licence or for the itinerants, they are travelling around, they're harder to police. Um, and I think that is a, a bigger the problem, is the policing of that. And SEPA, obviously, have got their own problems with other things. I mean, we only get visited three or four times a year from SEPA. But they obviously have a legal, if you're, uh, you know, how good your yard is. Um, and it's, I suppose it's all down to finances for and the amount of people that they've got available to check these things. Um, the the three stage thing was something I suggested, but if somebody obviously was dealing with the fringes along, get caught three times, you take the license away from them. Um, and that that was just a, a personal opinion. I thought it could maybe work. Mr. Adams, please. Mr. Mr. Hetherington's probably best to comment more. I believe on the situation. Um, in England, wh which has been in place, um, and I believe if, if an individual or a company is charged with metal theft, they will lose their licence. Which, and that, that should be the same. That, that should be the same for Scotland, because the bill, the bill was um, put, put through in England two years ago, and there was a number of um, 
number of errors with it, which have since been changed, and I believe it's been tightened up. And Mr. Hetherington is probably best placed to comment on that. Let's go to Mr. Hetherington then, please. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we heard about fit and proper person tests in the in the first session this morning. We would like to see there to be a fit and proper person test put in place within this bill as well. Um, we would also like to see some clear definition of what criteria a licensing authority could use in terms of you know, a, a non-exclusive um, list of offences, for example, that they could take into account or should take into account. Um, in terms of sentencing, um, we think the sentences, uh, sentencing levels laid out in the, uh, in the 82 Act as amended are inadequate. The, the rewards from people acting illegally um, on the margins of this business are high, potentially very high, and we believe that you know um, a, a, a level three fine, for example, is not an adequate disincentive. Um, and it, in fact, it's at the level where certain groups of people may well decide to take the hit um, on an occasional basis, and the rewards are worth it so we think that the level the fi levels of fine for for certain of these offenses m primarily acting without a license i mean that should be the number one you know the number one offense and should really uh, attract the maximum fine so yeah um, as, as a whole i think we believe that the levels are not adequate as currently defined and equally, there should be the ability for a licensing authority to refuse a license on the basis of a fit and proper person test um, or to revoke a license, importantly, if a certain uh, range of offences um, uh, need to be taken into account. We'd also ask that those who are guilty and have been found guilty of serious environmental offences, not just criminal offences, should also um, have those taken into account so that we don't get, as we talked about here, the proliferation of, of waste crime into, into metal theft and back again, which is, is I think, a, a, one of the dangers. Mr McCann, please. As I say, once again, the, the thing comes back down to it. We've actually got to look at it very, very closely and examine. I mean, I, the, the paperwork, I mean, I've got paperwork here. I could show you it goes back to the, the waste directives. And when you look at it, You've got a whole, you've got hundreds and hundreds of waste things, but because scrap is classified as waste, anybody can apply for a waste transfer license and a waste carrier's license, and this is wrong. It's got to be defined properly. And the other aspect of it, the waste, in just my own opinion, this is nothing to do with scrap metal being stolen. This comes back down to inland revenue looking for ways of collecting revenue for their sales. And it's so obvious, it's unbelievable. But to pass the buck on, yes, I'd love, love to see scrap metal stock, the stolen metals, but they can only do it if you tighten up the rules. Can, I point, can I point out, Mr McCann, that at this moment in time, uh, this Parliament has no powers over the inland revenue. I wish it were different. Uh, and we are looking at this entirely because of the aspect of the difficulties that many organisations and people in general on a day-to-day -day basis are having to suffer because of metal thefts. Um, and the ones that have been highlighted by the committee today, which included uh, rail infrastructure, uh, drains, uh, memorial statues, you know, this has got nothing to do with the revenue, but the inconvenience that this is causing people right across the country. Mr Wilson. No further questions, Kevin. Alec Rowley, please. Um, could I just very briefly, um, firstly, welcome and thanks for coming along today. Could I just briefly, there's a, a talk here about a, a need for a national register of scrap metal dealers. Do you maybe want to say a bit about that? Mr Hetherington, please. Um, we recognise that the licensing process is going to be a local process. Um, however, unlike a lot of uh, activities licensed by local authorities, this is not really a localised activity um, and is highly mobile. I mean, these gentlemen's sites are static in the locations they're in and they, therefore they can be seen and looked at and inspected 
However, they may well be buying from, from businesses, suppliers coming from all over Scotland, and they will be selling, by definition, um, all over Scotland and beyond Scotland. Um, itinerant collectors, I hate the word, I think it's pejorative, but mo I prefer mobile collectors if the, we could have that amended at some point, um, equally are highly mobile and will work in multiple authority areas. Um, it is therefore, I think, essential that there is a central place, an easily accessible place that the public, uh, the police, uh, and our members, in other words, sites, who are buying off these people, should be able to identify who are, are licensed, legitimate licensed operators in this industry. And that requires then local authorities to be under an obligation to provide the data and that that could be collated in a single place and provided online. Bearing in mind that a lot of the public sell, some of them are their own on their doorstep or give uh, to collectors, and I think it's right they should know that the people who are working in their communities, door-to-door -door collecting, are actually legitimate, um, because that way we might be able to also deal a, a, a death blow to the unfortunate occurrence of multiple local collectors going around some housing estates in some, some of our urban conurbations. So, um, yeah, I think it is an essential part of, of, of enforcement to have this national register um, because if, if the police pull over um, a mobile collector somewhere west of, um, west of Edinburgh, um, they won't have any means of legitimately knowing whether he's licensed or isn't licensed on which authority to apply for to, to determine. And having somebody present their license within five days is, in this train is, is, not, is not adequate. A license should be displayed on premises, visible to the public, or displayed on a vehicle so that people can see immediately are you licensed or aren't? Because the police can then take action immediately. Because if somebody isn't, hasn't displayed a license, they're committing an offence, they can then at least take the load away from them. Um, you know, it's the sort of sanction we need, which is, is quick policing and is effective policing. So, and I mean, SEPA, for example, are, are prepared in principle to undertake this work and provide this register, it could sit alongside their existing registers. Um, so I, I think it could be done. There is a cost issue, but you know, I think that, that that's one that it probably is open to discussion. Does anyone else have any comments on National Register? Mr. Williamson, please. Uh, convener, is, I don't know if you could make a law where you know, MD can sell any metal to any person at the moment. Make it like a law, because 95% or 98% of the country wants to abide by the law. Make it illegal for them to sell to somebody who's not a properly registered dealer or scrap merchant. And then that would obviously, the majority of public is going to deal with somebody who is properly registered. I don't know if that can fit in this bill or something. It was just an idea there. I don't know if that's practical, <laughs> but we've listened to that suggestion. Uh, Mr. Rowley, please. please. Okay. Uh, Willie Coffey, please. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, Mr. Hetherington, you mentioned uh, the metal theft alert system in your opening remarks. Could you tell us a wee bit more uh, about that? Does it operate in Scotland or is it yeah. England? And do all the dealers participate in this? How does it work? Is it a visual thing or is it a text uh, system? Could you describe no, it for us? It's, it's um, yes, it's an online um, it's an online alert system. Uh, all our members virtually work with smartphones smartphone is de rigueur and, and, and so all our members get a message identifying the theft and preferably using a, a photograph, if there's a photograph or similar, of the item or the material that's stolen. Mm. Um, and this goes out within an hour of us being alerted to it. Has it been effective so far in tracking down tracing items that have perhaps been stolen? Yes it has but it's a function of speed. I mean, if we get a really good description and it, we get it out within hours, it, it very often, it, it, very often, it's a member saying we've rejected the load, or you know, such and such looks familiar, or the vehicle looks familiar. 
Yeah, who, so, who gets the information? Who participates? Do the police get it? No, the police don't. This is aimed at the, where it, the trade, it, the trade, yeah. because that's where it's. De we assume that's where a th stolen yeah. material is destined for. Yeah. But as convener has alluded to, that of course we're seeing now, certainly in Scotland now, some direct exports beginning yeah. to emerge. But that's a different issue. So in terms of like, the number of traders, dealers, or individuals, are they're not all participating in that scheme? It would be great if they were, I suppose. Yeah. But how do we how do we widen it and, and bring in more people to participate? In that we've system? now got we've actually just formed a partnership, the ind an industry partnership with a with a group who have a similar but smaller system, which is much better than ours technically, um, and we've raised some money to uh, to spread that out, and that will be linked to the police. Um, and will provide a service then for police t notification. The problem is speed, because the, by the time it's getting into the police, and I'm not criticising them, it's a resource issue, uh, these things are not getting out quickly enough. So, I mean, there is a real problem with speed, and I think my colleagues have said if, if we'd not notified of these things really with that, within the day, then it is difficult to track stuff. Um, and there is more we can do with... Uh, we've done a lot with BT. There's more we can do with with um, the Scottish Electricity, with SSE and with Scottish Power, um, who haven't really been up to speed on this. So, yeah, we are envisaging rolling this out on a far more widespread basis beyond our own membership, which is also important. Okay, does anybody else want to add to that? Mr Adams, please. Yeah, just... Uh also, in a way, it's, a, it's an issue of closing down the, the avenues for, for the, the unscrupulous side of the trade to take material to. If, if, if someone, offers, someone offers you, I've got some lovely copper cable here, you're not going to buy it. You're not going to give them cash for it. You don't want it because it's not what you do. So if the bill goes through the way it is at the moment and the, the metal recycling industry has a full identification scheme and not cash, but other industries on the periphery are still able to operate out with the laws, there still will be a market for for the unscrupulous material. So that, that in a way, you know, that if, if all these other industries are pulled into the bill, that there won't be much of a market, if at all, hopefully, for this material, which should should shut it down. People aren't people aren't going to steal material if they can't get money for it. Thank you, Mr Adams. Yeah. Willie? Thank you. Um, Claire Adamson, please. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, I, I want to kind of push a wee bit on, on the, obviously, um, you've given examples of your legitimate businesses and how you operate and that you comply with all the re regulations. Um, not an expert in the industry at all, but my understanding is that from what's been said, that um, if you take the pyramid of the, the cycling, it's the, the ones at the bottom of the pyramid, where they don't have to comply to the same regulation that you have. Mr Hetherington mentioned smartphones. Obviously, technology is becoming much, much cheaper. Is, the, is there any of the, the regulations you have to comply to as the larger operating businesses that, you, in your opinion, could be pushed easily down to the broker level and local authorities? Mr Hetherington. Yes, I mean, I, we believe all of these are quite manageable. Um, at right the way through the trade, from, from the larger sites, right the way through to the mobile collector. Um, and we've tested this in, uh, across the border, mainly in Wales, um, where um, a mobile collectors have been encouraged to use smartphones to photograph the material they're buying or, the, or they're collecting, because they, in our view, they should take some identification of where they collected material um, photograph addresses um, and, and then photograph payment methods as well if they're paying for material. It can all be done and recorded on a phone and transferred very simply. This is not, you know, this is not Superman stuff. Uh, this is all, can all be done with no additional cost in terms of equipment. Uh, it does take a bit of time, but it's time well spent. So all the provisions that we're seeing here for identity and for payment restrictions in our view, should be applied at all levels of the industry and on the fringes of the industry, we've said. And our, we don't see any barriers for the small business to gain access through that. In fact, the proportionate cost is higher on the larger business 
because their installations have to be more complex and networked, and, and these are higher cost. But all that technology exists at the moment. Any other comments on that, gentlemen? Okay, thank could, you. Could I Claire? actually ask yep. Mr. McCann, because when you were talking about um, a level playing field, did you mean the smaller sort of businesses in that pyramid you described, or the ones external to the metal industry as the waste yes. areas? Uh, they don't have, we, we agree and we do, do our, our job, mm. but it doesn't apply to the smaller lad down, as they say. Uh, it's, it's just an anomaly, and it's something we've, we've got to to try and address. And if we can address it, it's great. But these gentlemen here, they do not want to go down the road where they end up in court and lose their business because their name, believe it or not, is very, very important to them. And we do, we, we, we guard their names very generously. But we do get upset when other, because of the way the bill has been written, you know, we're going to criminalise this. In fact, <laughs> To make a pun, and God we trust, everybody else pays cash. And that's a fact of life. And I'm not trying to be flippant about it, but it's something that you've got to look at the end of the day to say, are we going the right way or are we going the wrong way? Because once you start it and it goes through, then, then you've got the problems. Okay. Uh, Cameron Buchanan, please. Can I go back? Having visited a scrapyard, I see the problems of this storage for 48 hours. It just doesn't seem practical. But I see that Mr McCann at Dalton st stores his, his metal for longer than 48 hours. What do you think about this storage thing? It seemed to me very onerous at the time because the police obviously don't come within 48 hours and they're not there. Could I ask for your comments? Let's start with Mr McCann, who manages to cope at the moment with that. Basically, because what we have in Edinburgh... Right, and the smaller material, say from the the, uh, the, the householder, uh, you hold that stuff for 14 days. The stuff that you, you buy off the engineering works, no, you don't, because you know exactly where it comes from. You've got a, a paper trail, so that moves on. It's the smaller material, and this is where I'm applying back to the small merchants. They hold it for 14 days, so that part is clear. And if it if it goes down to Mr. Williamson's yard. He realises where he's buying it off it. It's, it's set, set there for 14 days. The police have had more than ample chance. Then it sits in his yard probably for another 14 days anyway because of the way the market's got them down. This is how it's played. But unfortunately, it doesn't play the way we would like to see the rules. We are by them, but nobody else are by them. So we are the ones who's left for the baby. Mr Williamson, please. I don't agree with that because I obviously... In a yard, if you say you've got an acre of a yard and you've got a way bridge, and to give you an idea, you get these skip lorries come in with the council material in like they're in 20 foot container size. So they'll come in, and you would probably tip two or three of them in this room. That would take up maybe 10, 15 percent of your yard space. By the end of the day, you would run out of yard space if you had to keep that material, not move it for 48 hours. There is another thing in the bill about notifying when you process material, a date and a time. Now, obviously, the bigger the yard, the worse it is, because obviously when the material comes in, we put it to machines and we chop it up and we squash it and we bale it for moving on to larger steelworks or going abroad. But obviously, it's just the fuel, the volume of material coming in, because obviously it's always light and loose, so you have to process it. <coughs> Another thing, it would probably cause a problem for SEPA, because you've got tonnage limits, you've got space confinements, you've got certain areas you can only have certain materials in for certain lengths of time. Certain materials could come in and you could chop it and put it in stock and wait for the market to go up, but I'm generally talking about the scrap. It wouldn't work. From, you, you, you would have to shut my yard down within a week. Mr Adams, please. Yeah, just in agreement with what Mr um, Williamson said, really, um, you, you saw the scrap yard in Edinburgh it being possible. We'd operate on a Monday and a Thursday, um, and th that would really be it. SEPA would have huge issues with it. Um, also, the health and safety executive would, would have huge issues with it. The industry is under increased pressure from the health and safety executive, and also, indeed, our own insurance companies would have would have huge, huge issues with it. So it's 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 not workable. It's just not workable. Mr. Hetherington. Yes, I mean the the different aspect of this is, of course, that. Uh, uh, the definition of a mobile collector or itinerant collector is that they don't operate a site. So I'm not quite certain how uh, how a mobile collector would um, hold material for 48 hours or whatever it was 
without a site, apart from piling it up on the road outside the house. So I, I think... Mr. Williamson. One other point. If obviously the cash bag comes in, and we all expect that's going to stop 95% of the, the theft. Yeah, actually, the 48 hour things, it's not needed as much. Redundant. Yes. Because mm -hmm. you're wanting to keep the material for the police to see it. If you ban the cash and you think you've stopped the, the crime, in essence, you don't need to keep the material. Okay, John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Just to uh, follow up Mr. Hetherington's uh, written submission to the committee, you make reference to the fact that the current bill, the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland bill, uh, wants to try and stop cash payments, and you then go on to talk about the Scrap Metal Dealers Act 2013 in England and Wales. Uh, and but you allude to the Scotland, the bill being presented in Scotland, contains significant weaknesses compared to uh, the legislation down south. Would you want to expand on what those weaknesses are? Uh, because what we're trying to do is, while not mirror the English and Welsh legislation, but certainly get to a level playing field and, if possibly, uh, get a better uh, uh, legislation in Scotland and regulation in Scotland than currently applies if there are weaknesses with the English and Welsh legislation. Mr Hetherington, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I mean, we've dealt with quite a number of these weaknesses as we see them today. Um, I'll just very quickly go through the definition of scrap metal we believe isn't inadequate. The definition of a metal dealer, especially where w the bill as it, so it describes a buying and selling of scrap metal as the, as the definition of a scrap metal dealer, which should be buying or selling, in our view, very, very strongly our view. Uh, payment methods, um, uh, I think, w I know that the Scottish Government were keen to avoid getting into some detail here, but I do think this is an area with payments that there has to be some detail, there has to be some prescription. Um, because this is a complex area. And for example, I'll give you one example, but um, and, um, cash cards that don't require you to hold any identification. I mean, that, in our view, is, is the direct equivalent of, of cash. Um, there may be an argument that the bill as drafted is, is, um, you know, is, is non-prescriptive, but in, in essence, without spelling that out, I think it, it actually lends itself to misinterpretation um, and, and, and poor enforcement. Um, local authority licensing, I've dealt with that in terms, of, um, in terms of register. I mean, inconsistent licensing conditions, if we are to see high levels of inconsistency, I take mobile collectors, for example. If mobile collectors are only to be licensed in one local authority, they will license themselves in the cheapest local authority or the one that's least, least stringent in terms of its condition. I mean, this will, we, we, we'll, I've termed it licensed tourism, but um, this will be rampant. And these, these are very bright, you know, bright people. Um, and I think that has to be dealt with. And that uh, probably best dealt with through strong guidance and uh, a strong duty on consistency placed on local authorities, licensing authorities, sorry. Um, uh, yes, display. I've dealt with the display of licenses, the establishing of seller's identity. We haven't talked about too much, but again, I know Scottish Government sought to avoid too much detail here, but the, the bill on the face of it, or certainly in, uh, in, in guidance, if guidance can be, can be um, definitive, um, has got to set out what forms of identity and what processes are required within the bill. In other words, is it, do you need to verify the name and address by reference to a, a publicly available uh, means of ID that contains a photograph and, a, and an address, for example, um, which would be our recommendation, and then some alternatives. Uh, tag and hold we, we've referred to. Suitable applicant or the, the fit and proper person test um, we believe is an omission. Um, we believe that there should be consultation with SEPA on application of a new licence 
or for renewal of a license because, and um, uh, Joe has highlighted this, the, like it or not, the correlation between waste licensing and um, scrap metal dealer licensing is very close indeed. And if somebody is, in, frankly, in breach of one, then the, that should be taken into account. Um, and I think there's some, uh, um, uh, some work needs to be done on who is being licensed. Um, these are not all individuals. A large number of the licensees in Scotland will be corporate entities of one sort or another. And I think some thought has to be given as to whether you're licensing the site manager, it's back to the discussion you had in the first session, or whether it's the owner or the controlling mind. And the owner and the controlling mind may not be the same, and that might not be the same as the site manager. So I think in a lot of these areas, what our, our, our assertions are that this, I'm afraid I think the bill needs more detail. Um, I would also comment, because I've been asked to, that I think trying to mesh this in with the Civic Government Act 82 uh, adds a level of complexity and interweaving here which is, is, um, does make it very difficult to, to read and understand, even for those of us whose job it is to read and try and understand these things. Um, we've been impertinent enough to, to actually produce a draft, a suggested rewording of some sections of this, which might bring it all together in one place, um, which the Scottish Government officials have and, and, and your clerks have. Um, and just to say we would be very happy as this moves on to work with this committee and, and, and with Scottish Government officials to try and make this a better better bit of legislation. We would like to see the best legislation in Scotland. Thank you very much. Uh, do you, any of you other gentlemen have anything else to add? No. Okay. Can I thank you very much for your evidence today and I suspend and we move into private session.